ITB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. A very good morning to you at half past seven this Monday morning. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, we're here with you all the way through until 10 o'clock. And what a show we have lined up for you. We're going to speak with Sam Bennett, fresh from his green jersey escapades in the Tour de France. A stage win on the Champs-Élysées to wrap things up in style. We'll bring you some video from his home, from his uh, grandfather, and then we'll speak to the man himself around about 9.45 this morning. Kenny Cunningham is going to join us from 8 o'clock this morning to talk about all the football at the weekend. Ruth Fahey is going to look back on a 3-0 defeat for the Republic of Ireland women's national team. And Alan Quinlan... He's going to talk to us about a chastened Leinster after Saracens came into their house and absolutely annihilated them in that first half in the uh, Heineken Champions Cup quarterfinal. So, very busy show for you. If you want to get in touch, 087 9180 is the number. Or, of course, just use the hashtag OTBAM on Twitter. First, here's a taste of yesterday's Sunday paper review. John Duggan was in the chair, joined by Clean O'Connor and Philip Quinn. Enjoy. OTB. AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Get to the mail, I think, first, actually, and the story about Sam Bennett, which is interesting, and in the back as well of the um, Sunday Independent. Philip, uh, you were there in 1989 when Sean Kelly was the last Irish green jersey wearer, so bring him back memories of Sam Bennett achievement today. Yeah, hard to believe, John, it's 31 years ago, and uh, I decided to wear a green t shirt today. Uh, uh, in honour of respect to link Sean Kelly and uh, and Sam Bennett and the Tour de France. I'm just television on the corner here. The real deep part is about to take place now in the final uh, run into Paris. Um, Bennett is almost there. I think if he gets any points in the intermediate sprint, that'll do him. But I wouldn't rule out Sagan trying to come up with something. Peter Sagan is a fierce competitor and um, I think he's won a record number of green jerseys. So we could have a little bit of a, a twist in the tail. We had a twist in the tail yesterday, obviously, in the time trial. Um, so Bennett, almost there. Uh, be an extraordinary story. Um, I have the Daily Mail here, Irish Daily Mail on Sunday. Yeah. Mail um, on Sunday, my colleague Mark Gallagher has done a very fine piece, sort of a background analysis of uh, Sam Bennett's rise uh, through the ranks and a lovely headline there, a sure thing, a little play on words. And, you know, a um, couple of little things that people may, may or may not know, like he, he, he was born in Belgium, and you might kind of ask, how was he born in Belgium? Because he did cycle there later on. He was born in Belgium because his father, Mick Bennett, who played for Waterford, uh, Waterford uh, United, uh, played in an FAI Cup final in 1986. Um, he, he was playing in Belgium for a few years and uh, Sam was born there, but he moved back to Carrick and Shore and, um, and he's been there since the age of four. And when you think about it, you know, that Carrick and Shore story is, is extraordinary, really, that a, a small South Tipperary town, and I don't mean, I mean that in a nice possible way, so I've been down there many a times, a lovely part of the world, that it has produced two extraordinary cyclists in Sean Kelly and now, and now Sam Bennett. And as you say, 31 years on, um, I did a little retro piece uh, for the for the Mail on Sunday today over here in this corner where I was think, recalling how four of us, four journalists, uh, spent three weeks in the car uh, in the Tour de France. Not an easy thing to do to spend three weeks in the car uh, with three colleagues. Um, and we shared uh, press rooms, we shared hotel rooms. Uh, we never had a room on our own. Um, we got cranky. Uh, we, we probably were a bit annoyed at one another at times, and uh, but we had some great stories and some great laughs. I remember the final day uh, on the Champs Elysees, we were, we Sean Kelly came from tenth to ninth, and he got the green jersey. But that wasn't the story of the day, as you think, as, as you will recall. The story of the day was uh, Lauren Fignon's uh, collapse, if you like. Although he, he, he rode, I think he had his second fastest ever time trial, but he was caught out and passed on the final day by Greg Lamont, who had this sort of fancy bike with a sort of a disc wheels and the, and the sort of fork-like uh, handlebars and um, no one could believe that, that Le Mans could have caught Fignon and it was the last time the Tour de France had a time trial finish on the Champs-Élysées. They said it would never work, lacked the drama, but that day was, was extraordinary drama and Fignon collapsed uh, on, the, on the tarmac afterwards. Couldn't believe he'd given everything and Le Mans had come from nowhere to catch him. And I remember my colleague, my colleague um, uh, John Brenner of the, of, the, of the Irish press came out with a great intro, fair play to him, and his intro was along the lines of... Um, uh, the length of time it will take you to read this sentence is is the, is the gap that separated Greg LeMond and Lauren Fignon after 3,000 miles of, of hard racing. It was a great intro, and um, that was that was an extraordinary story. But we have another story today, and I say Mark Gallagher has given the, the nuts and bolts, all the background about um, Mark, about Sam Bennett and how the Tour de France went went through uh, Carrick and Shore in 1998. Mm. And he was a seven-year-old, and. Uh, even then, he was regarded as a young phenomenon. And what a story it would be today when he wears green. And we're wearing green for Sam Bennett on the Champs-Élysées today.
Absolutely, yeah. And Greg LeMond near, was, nearly died in a, in a shooting accident before he came back and won that tour in 89. And uh, I'm reading this at the back of the um, Sunday Independent from Eamon Sweeney, uh, Kleena. Uh, today, Sam Benish, the second green jersey winner from a small Irish town of just over 5,000 people, will have his hour of glory as the greatest finale to one of the world's greatest sporting events unfolds in the world's greatest city. Say magnifique. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a great story. And um, as Philip was saying there, when, when two people two greats of, of one sport come from a little town, You all the sports psychologists and everything start digging into it and, and is it um, is it role modelling and, and what is it about that place? But it's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a great day for for Sam in the, the last couple of days and it's it's a good story for, for Irish cycling. Absolutely. And also in that paper, um, the kind of the front, the lead is Paul Kimmage uh, speaking to Gary O'Toole, Kleena. Yeah, it's a... I mean, it's what we've come to expect from Paul in terms of his personal interviews, and it's he sets it up in in a really personal fashion, and it's a fantastic piece on page two and three of the the Indo, um, a fantastic piece on, piece on a subject matter which isn't isn't great. No and, sensitive uh, content here, yeah. No, very sensitive content, and um, I mean, it's it's really really well written, and it's a really it it pulls you in from the very beginning. I mean, Paul. He's obviously known Gary for, for a long time, and you can tell that throughout the piece. Um, and it gives a, a good background to, uh, reminds us, I suppose, of, of the the nature of Gary's achievements in swimming, introduces us to um, his his swimming coach when he was in school, uh, Glenn, uh, Gwen Collins, and yes. paints this beautiful picture of this his first swimming coach who, who pretty much just let him at it, let him figure it out. There's a, there's a lovely piece um, where Gary says, it was our PE teacher, Gwen Collins, who taught me to swim. She had just graduated from the NIHE in Limerick in the same class or group as the likes of Brian Mullins. And she was an extraordinary coach in so far. She did know a lot about swimming, but she knew enough to find out where to learn. She got this book, The Science of Swimming, um, by the head coach of at Indiana, who would coach Gary Hall, senior and Mark Spitz. And she would open a page and say, see that there, that's the way you're supposed to be looking in the water. Swim down there and see if you can make it look like that. And I had a, um, had an ability to mimic what I saw, which for any of us involved in coaching, there's there's a train of thought of, you know, d don't be over coaching, just let people at it. And obviously this this woman, Gwen, who since went on to become a nun, um, but obviously had a massive impact on Gary and, and sent, sent him a, a birthday card and he talks really, really fondly of her. And I mean, that, it, the scale of the piece itself or the context of the piece itself, it sets up a lovely comparison or a stark comparison as opposed to lovely between her influence and, and what he felt from her and then when he went on to meet George Gibney and the, I suppose, the type of coach he was and the impact he had. And he talked about, um, you know, that when George Gibney started coaching him and Gary was young um, and he was winning community games at that point, Gary wasn't George's um, meal ticket. Um, it was the older guys, and he was. Gary says I was the sporting equivalent of a pension plan that would would mature in a couple of years. So he wasn't paying much attention. It it just I mean the the whole piece, I suppose, and it, it looks like it's the the first in maybe a series of them, but it it, it really sets the tone and sets a stark comparison of uh, a really human, connected, powerful coach of a of a young, talented swimmer. And somebody who who really, I suppose, ran a very very divisive divisive and toxic swimming club. Yeah, and you'd hope there's justice here. I mean, I hope there's I hope there's more. I hope there's justice out of this. And uh, this obviously been highlighted in in certain areas and by Paul uh, today. And I think the one thing I I, I wanted when I kind of read this uh, this piece. Um, with Gary O'Toole, as I wanted to read more, which is obviously always the the thing. Um, uh, interesting to be talking about Michelle Smith. I last saw Michelle probably in 97, late 97. I don't know, actually. I'm trying to think whether I've seen her since. Uh, the drugs test with Alan K. Guy in, what, 1998. Um, but also, Paul, just putting out of the, the stars how, um, you know, big Gary O'Toole was at the time. <laughs> like, uh, you know, he was a European silver medalist. He was he had the world at, a, at his feet, really. He, he did, and that, that, again, that came across, and he... Um, he described winning, winning the European second in Europe, and then being on the plane uh, and chalky, as as his nickname is, uh, 
asking him about his experience of Gibney and then I suppose his whole his whole swimming world coming crashing down and being sit, sitting sitting on a plane thinking what am I going to do with this and he's he's quick to point out that he doesn't he doesn't blame any subsequent performances or anything on that but in terms of his whole relationship with swimming and relationship with the head coach of 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 Ireland I think that changed a lot as as it would and even he's Gary gives a good example of how I suppose his attitude to swimming changed that he was he was sort of relentless and grumpy and didn't really engage with other swimmers and then he on a training camp in Arizona I think it was in 89 he meets a, a swimmer called Willie Johnson who was a, a former or, or an OEC officer from Belfast and I suppose it gave him a whole new perspective on being a bit more relaxed and engaging with your your teammates and and enjoying it a little bit more and he said that and that taught me a lesson i realized i would have none of those stories that that um these other swimmers had if i kept going the way i was going so i started to cop on and relax a bit more and that's that was just before he won that um that silver medal in the european championship so it i mean there's a lot in it there's there's gary's a personal relationship with swimming and his ups and downs and when he when he performed and won and when he didn't and then there's the bigger story of of George Gibney. Yeah, it's uh, an excellent piece which we um we will discuss I'm sure next week and and, and going forward. Um it's been a tough week for Irish racing, Philip. It's it's uh it's like I wrote about it myself on the on the website here for OTB Sports and on the app about Pat Smullen like it's uh, like as Eamon Sweeney writes today, the death seems extraordinarily unfair. The life was done undeniably great and the good this man did will live, live long after. Yeah, a huge loss for Irish racing, a huge loss for Irish sport. And John, you, you, you're one of the journalists that tries to keep uh, racing to the forefront, um, you know, uh, as a radio broadcaster. And I, I try and do a little bit for the newspaper, for the mail as well. Um, it's not always easy to do it, you know, you're up against the leviathans of, of football, GA and rugby. Um, but I think even people in those sports were aware of Pat Mullen's goodness um, as a person. And I think the outpouring of, 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 of grief and, uh, um, and, and sincerity uh, towards him after he passed uh, just is an example of, what, of the esteem of which he was held. Um, uh, when, when the news came through late the other night and, and I was just doing a few paragraphs for the, for the mail, I, I had a quick Google just because I remember the Harzan Derby, Epsom Derby, um, and, and you, you appreciate good jockeys. And his ride that day, I think if you look back on it, um, you know, he had Aidan O'Brien, I'm not quite sure which two horses they were, but he had one on the inside, he had one coming down the outside, and he had Harzan, and he had him running straight, he, and, and he refused to flinch, and he just kept him going and going and going, and he was sure he was going to be taken by either of the O'Brien horses. But he, in the Aga Khan silks, he just kept his horse on a straight line. And it was, it was so courageous and so sort of disciplined. And then towards the end, about 50 yards from the, from the post, he actually began to go away a little bit. And um, that was a very special ride. And then, of course, Harrison won the Irish Derby a couple of weeks later uh, to do that very difficult double. And as you know, um, the O'Brien's horses have been really, really strong and, and dominating those races. And as O'Brien said during the week, we threw everything at, at, at Pat Smullen that day. Um, and he saw us off, and that was, you know, O'Brien's a competitor. Um, very sad. I mean, I think for me as well, John, and you, you, you probably were there last year at the Curra. Uh, I couldn't make it, but I watched it on television um, when they had the uh, Cancer for Charity trials uh, race day, uh, charity day, as part of the sort of the Champions Weekend. And it, it very quickly it became the race of the weekend. And even though you had the Champion Stakes at Leperstown, and you had the Saint Ledger, and you had three or four other Group Ones, the, the Matron, and other, and other races, the race that everybody was talking about was was Pat Mullins' race. And you had the the elite jockeys of of, of jump racing and flat racing, McCoy and Walsh and Carberry and Richard Hughes, and Kieran Fallon. All the greats were, were, were going to ride the Curragh, and they were only going. They were going for Pat Mullen, and McCoy was the man who had said he would never ever get on a horse ever again. Yeah, here he was prepared to do it for for Pat Mullen, and little things like that uh, I think was mentioned in the Sunday in the Sunday um, Times today. A little small mention by Don McLean, but he says the stable staff that day they get prizes for the best turned out horses um, over the weekend, and they donated those prizes um, to the. Uh, to the Cancer Trials Ireland Fund. So it was just a little gesture, but so you had the, the elite jockeys, you had the, the, the people who you know get the horses to look a, a, as good as they can on the day, and they were giving what they could. And they had hoped to raise, I think, about a million, but they ended up raising, I think, as, as, as Don 2.6. 2.6, which was extraordinary. 
uh, and and Smullen was there, and I, we watched that race in the rain, and uh, and and the guys, the guys they're all a little chirpy beforehand, you know. There's a bit of a bit of banter, but as soon as it, as soon as they got going, uh, their game faces came on. They all wanted a win. They wanted a winner for Pat Smullen, and of course McCoy had to do it. You know, the the iron horse, the iron jockey, the iron man, um, and that to me was, was was moving. But very sad. Everybody will miss him terribly. A nine times Irish champion jockey, um, universally liked. Uh, by everybody respected, um, and and he had a really tough battle. I mean, when we heard the the diagnosis, uh, and you hear the word pancreatic cancer, and anybody who has any knowledge of 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 issues, medical issues, would have known that that was a huge fight for Pat to have to climb to come through. And he did, and he and he, and he fought as he fought like a lion. He fought as like like Harzan did uh, at the Derby in the Curra uh, and at Epsom. And um, it's a huge loss for Irish racing, huge loss for Irish sport, and. Uh, a reminder that we should be thankful of, of every day that we, we are blessed with good health. Absolutely, Philip, well said. Um, I think uh, dignity, class and bravery is what shone through from Pat Smullen, uh, Kleena. Um, like the, it re reminds me a bit, it's a little bit of a different circumstance uh, of the Terry Fox story. This was the guy who um, you know, ran uh, across from the east to the west. Uh, he wanted to run from the east to the west coast of Canada and he, he passed away during the, the attempt. But he kept going, and he, 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 he like he became a national hero in Canada in the early 1980s. And for Pat to be so selfless uh, and to, to to have that idea around uh, the the race day and the the raising the money for for cancer trials and the actual tangible, um, you know, they've got a new machine in Vincent's Hospital. Um, they've got uh, a new system are coming in now in Ireland and. It's 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 kind of it's it's very very tough to to read that sometimes actually somebody has has made uh, even in a way a sacrifice by their own uh, actions in 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 bearing this and uh, and helping other people into the future. I think in both pieces that I read um, in the Sunday Times, Don McLean and and Eamon Sweeney in the Sunday Independent, Philip used the word sincerity, and that really comes across in in both both articles and. It seems like the person he was off his horse on the ground, that that genuine, humble, sort of steadfast individual. And uh, from what I'm reading, people would say he rode the same way, that he was he rode in a non-dramatic, efficient, controlled manner, got himself in the in the right place um, and a very consistent jockey over his time. And like every single thing is is about what he was like as a human being and the small things they're talking about his uh, from Offaly and, and involved in, in the local GA club and even Derry Town and, and just well liked by everybody and and isn't that what people say that a, a measure of who you are no matter if you're one of the greatest jockeys in Ireland but how you treat people and by the sounds of it anybody who came across Pat Smullen he treated them exceptionally well and that charity race because if you're talking about the best jockeys in Ireland um, and they're all turning up and no, none of them for a second would consider not um, not turning up to, to his ch his charity race and turn up with a heart and a half to, to give to his cause and what he was trying to do it just says a lot about him as a person and the legacy and the impact he can be obviously fierce competitors with other jockeys but but at the end of it, he was an exceptional human being by the sounds of it. Absolutely. Yeah, well said, Kleena, and uh, may he rest in peace. Um, this is from Shane Ross, uh, the former Minister for Sport in the Sunday Independent. Uh, I'll just hold it up here. Delaney's long personal party at the FAI's expense. So just uh, the Football Association was left with a legacy of debt and the Noel Guard addicted to privilege, writes Shane Ross. Uh, amid all the applause for the host that night in Kilkenny, this is referring to John Delaney's 50th birthday, Delaney himself knew that the FAI under his stewardship was secretly heading for bankruptcy. Uh, to his apparent credit, I still saw him at local football games mixing with the grassroots. Uh, he seemed to be firmly grounded, willing to spend his weekends cavorting with the captains and the kings of fo global football while using his weekends to visit smaller clubs. And uh, no one suspected what horrors lurked hidden under the FAI bonnet, waiting to be discovered. That's some, just some parts of the Shane Ross. I actually have the book here, Champagne Football, of Mark Tighe and uh, Paul Rowan. I've written, and just uh, this is quotes in the book. Uh, I don't hear people giving out said uh, Shane Ross's interview on the station. This is a few years ago. I read all about it in the press, all right. There's a lot of criticism about John Delaney. My own experience is that when I go to these local games in the constituency on the ground, I see John Delaney and representatives of the FBI all the time. They're always in the ground doing things or relating to these really important things that young people are doing. 
So um, I suppose one of the things that I kind of have taken away from this and, and all, all the revelations that have shocked many people, uh, Philip, is that uh, corporate governance um, wasn't there at the FAI, but the oversight of that um, may not have been there to the extent that it should have. I think the corporate governance issues have been resolved, and now we've got a new CEO to come in. Uh, his name is Jonathan Hill, and what he'll be tasked with doing is uh, sorting out the a commercial side of the FEI, because if you're if you're reading the, some of the Sunday paper, like once again in your paper again today, um, like the IRFU and the GA are in a, in a were in a sound financial position, and they're you know ringing the alarm bells about COVID. It's costing the IRFU five million a month. The GA will need uh, effectively to get a 19 and a half million euro uh, support system in place uh, for the GA championships to take place uh, between now and the end of December, which I think everybody will want from a morale point of view in the country. Uh, but the FAI are not exactly in that healthier position uh, because of what's gone on. And uh, I think what I'm reading in the newspaper here in the Sunday Independent is all really well and good, but um, and maybe people can say that UEFA and FIFA would automatically come in and say you can't interfere. Uh, but I think what we've seen is that uh, uh, oversight is crucial. Yeah, um, it's a delicate one, John, and I know where you're coming from on this one. Um, you know, the FAI have relied very heavily on funding from Sport Ireland, which is the government's arm for funding all associations in Ireland. And Shane Ross was in charge of that for, for uh, the, the tenure of the previous government. Um, you know, he, he did pop up at lots of um, events, uh, internet matches in the, in the Irish national team, um, uh, including the European finals of 2016. Um, so uh, I'm not quite sure about his conversion. Um, you know, why wasn't he asking quite harder questions? I'd like to know that. Um, and now, in fairness, when it all erupted uh, in March of, 20, um, uh, of 2019, uh, he, he, he certainly was very active. Um, and governance was his, was his, his catchphrase, with a capital G. Uh, but I'm kind of wondering what he was doing for a couple of years before that. Um, but look, uh, you know, Sport Ireland and... Uh, you know, and the FEI's auditors, you know, Sport Ireland would have got the FEI's books every year, the FEI's accounts every year, They're, you know, they could have gone through them with a fine two column and just sort of seen, was there, was there anything amiss, anything look a little out of place? I'm not a financial whiz at all. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a past maths person, I'll be honest with you there. Um, I study, when I look at balance sheets, I, I, I'm really not sure what, I'm, what, I, what, I, what, I, what I can see, what other people can see who are much more forensic than I am. But there was clearly... Um, things that not weren't quite right. I mean, I, I've written about this and, 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 it, and it, it does come up in the book, you know, that, you know, for example, the, the sports direct money that the FAI, that Delaney had, had suddenly conjured up out of a sleeve and he said, we're okay, we have this. And, and uh, you know, that, that, that became a 6.5 million, um, that, 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 that was appearing in the books as, as a sort of a, a sponsorship, but it was actually, it was effectively a loan, they had to pay it back. Um, when Sport Ireland pulled out, they had three and a half, three years to pull out, and they pulled out, and now the FAI are still paying that money back, but the money was had already disappeared. But look, there is go governance has certainly has improved at the FAI. I will say that. Um, and I know you've had a lot of people talking about about the book about champagne football and about the great work that Mark Ty and Paul Rowan have done. But I think other people maybe could look at themselves and see what 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 could they have done. I mean, journalists, including myself and a lot of others, we asked questions, we were muzzled, we were warned off, um, and maybe people who were you know, in, 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 in powerful positions in terms of uh, checking and balances for the FAI's books, uh, in terms of grants for the FAI, maybe they should have been doing a little bit more. Uh, but certainly Ross did, in, in the year that before the election and from March 19, he was very determined that the old guard had to go, um, and, and, and Delaney had to go with them, and, and, and it has gone. And look, we, we're trying to move on. Um, I think um, we've had a lot of think tanks, and we've had a lot of uh, committees, and we've had a lot of... Um, you know, we're, we're, we're now in a situation where we've had uh, interim CEOs, deputy interim CEOs, and, and now Gary Owens is, is not going forward. Now Quinn is, is, is also going. And the FAI, um, finally, uh, their last permanent CEO was John Delaney, who stepped down uh, on the night of the Ireland-Gibraltar game at the end of March 2019. And we're about, the Football Association is about to have its next permanent CEO to be announced uh, probably next week. Jonathan Hill uh, is his name, an Englishman, Leeds United supporter. Uh, so he shares that in common with, with Roy Barrett, the independent FAI chair. Uh, he brings a strong track record of, of, of business, of, on the business side of, of, of football. I worked at the FA um, around Euro 96, around uh, the launch of Club Wembley, um, 
and uh, has a strong and proven track record of, of delivering big sponsorships for the English FA. He's also worked with uh, with IMG and Cantaro and, uh, and Laureus. So he's got a really strong track record of sport and business together. I think that's why he probably got the job ahead of... Sarah Keane was, was very strongly fancied, uh, CEO of Swim Ireland and uh, senior figure in the Olympic Federation of Ireland. But I think the fact that, that Hill has a track record of... of of football and business together and the FAI need deals. I mean, uh, Shane McGrath in the Mail on Sunday makes a point that the IRFU's big sponsorship at the moment uh, is 5.1 million, I think it is. Um, Vodafone, yeah. yeah. Vodafone and the FAI's big sponsorship is is is, is a, less than a, a quarter of that with three and three are pulling out. So you have the FAI's main senior sponsor is going, is coming, say that it's down to the end of the year, but they're gone. Um, the League of Ireland, SSC Electricity, they're gone at the end of this season. So there's two big vacancies there for big, big sponsors for the FAI. And the FAI are entering in their 100th year next year. Um, technically, this is the 100th year of the FAI Cup, sponsored by Extra.ie, and also the 100th year of the League of Ireland. But because uh, we've had we had we had two 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 FAI Cups one year and two leagues, but next year is the anniversary of the League of, of the FAI being founded. It was founded in 1921, and you know. Irish football needs something big to happen next year on the commercial side. It needs a big, big sponsorship of the international teams. And probably you might see a separation with the ladies getting, who are, who are to me, it's a very undeveloped resource in terms of women's football that should be brought on a lot more. They're, they're getting there, and Vera Post is, is doing a good job. Good result yesterday, never mind the scoreline. Uh, you might see two sponsorships coming in there, and the League of Ireland is a new sponsorship. And the FAI Cup, extra dollar a year, the sponsor at the moment. We'll see what happens next year. Um, so these are big challenges for Jonathan Hill to come in. He has to you know, deliver big, big uh, uh, deals. And if you look at the, the salary he's on, is actually very modest. It's it's a senior civil service it's equivalent. benchmarked, yeah. Yeah. yeah, benchmarked by state, so it's 207, 209. Uh, Delaney at his peak was on 462, um, you know, with, with ridiculous expense allowances that, yeah. that, that were signed off. We all know about them. So Hill, Hill's got a big challenge. I think if he delivers big deals, John, he'll get percentages of them, so that'll boost things up a little bit. Um, but look, uh, a big challenge for him, and uh, I think Irish football will, will, will wish him well. Um, and I think he's coming in at the right time. I think there'll be a lot of goodwill towards him, but a huge. I mean, you've touched upon it. Income for League of Ireland clubs is is not is is, is all eighty percent is based on, on on attendances and there's nobody going to games at the moment uh, until we can get people back in I think that's going to be a problem for the international team the League of Ireland as it is for the GA and the IRFU um, I wish Hill well and uh, I, I think the fact that he's coming from across the way he's got no baggage here in, in Ireland and I think that, that that's a, that's a positive yeah. and he'll start with a, a blank with a, with a clean slate and everybody rowing in behind him but he'll be judged on on, on what he delivers off the field. We all talk about what might happen and our hopes and dreams for the day, but that's not real life. Dadcast with Cadbury Fredo Treasures. Tuesdays from 3 p.m. on OTB Sports Radio. Tune in on the OTB Sports app. As we learn to live with COVID-19, sport and fitness for your family are more important than ever. At the Sport Ireland campus in Blanchardstown, our facilities aren't just for elite athletes, but the community as well. So for European Week of Sport, we're hosting an open week from September 24th for families to try out a new sport and fitness experience together. So join dad for gymnastics or mum for rugby with over 20 different options. Check sportirelandcampus.ie for more. The all-new OTB Sports app. It's all videos, sports news, live scores, interviews, podcasts, all waiting for you. Search OTB Sports on your app store and download now. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. 7.59 this morning. It is an unbelievably busy Monday morning. Kenny's in studio with us. Kenny, how are you? Morning, Jerry. Good. All good. Owen Sheehan is out and about somewhere, recovering from the uh, rave in Oliver Bond. Owen, how are you? Uh, yeah, I've actually uh, got out of Dublin City to distance myself from such allegations. And was it, was it a good rave? As raves go. <laughs> I actually haven't even seen the video. Uh, it, 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 was, uh, it was outdoor and uh, that was about it. I, I, it actually took a bit of work to find this video yesterday because I'd heard so much about it. Yeah, uh, well, I, you know, I'm sure... I'm sure it was a good night, a good time was had by many, many people, as is generally the case these. We were too busy watching sport, Owen, isn't that right? All weekend? Yeah. Like, I mean, we spoke about these very weekends about three months ago, when it's like, oh, well, you know, when things get back to normal, uh, those uh, bumper sporting weekends are going to be off the charts. Now, of course, things have not got back to normal whatsoever, but these bumper sporting weekends have very much gone ahead. All these things have very much been crammed together. 
and it's great. It's, I mean, it's like it certainly makes up for you know getting to do other things with your life in April, which was a very sad way to be. I like having nothing to do with my life except watch sport now. Yeah. So we had um, the Tour de France finishing at the same time as a US Open in golf. We had the NBA and the NFL and the Premier League and all the weekends GA and of course. Uh, um, interesting weekend, but not a great one for our rugby in the Heineken Champions Cup. That's not. That's. I mean, how do we? How do we even fit all this into the next two hours? Well, exactly. I mean, Owen, Owen mentions a bumper weekend, but it's not actually easy, Owen, is it? To get actually watch all of these, all these things are on, but to actually navigate your way through them and allocate time to actually sit down and watch your recording. I can't record, obviously. No, I haven't got that facility where I'm limited in what I can watch. So I'm literally a bit of a rover at the moment. I'm kind of. Like I said to you, turning up on people's doorsteps and keep keeping your contacts to the. Uh, oh, I'm a bare, oh, bare, bare minimum, bare minimum, bare minimum. <laughs> I would say though, I'd like to sh shout up um, Union Cafe. Owen probably knows he's man about town. Union Cafe, Stroke Kennedy's pub out in Deer Park. I uh, rocked up to yesterday because I was struggling to get an outside TV to watch the uh, the football. So a pal of mine, big sports support, uh, took me out there. It was brilliant. Big, uh, massive plasma. Great food, great buzz, kids playing in the park, screaming and shouting. Great couple of hours. You were watching some football there? Yeah, watched the early, watched the um, Southampton Spurs game before coming into work on the, uh, the Chelsea game after. So, yeah, but it's not, just my point is, it's just not, not easy for me to actually watch the, the, the amount of sport that's on is great, but to actually take it all in and to allocate a bit of time to it, it's not, not as easy as it sounds. Kids playing in the park screaming and shouting is a very harsh analysis of Jose Mourinho's team <laughs> in the first half, I thought, yesterday. It, you're, right, you're right, though, Kenny. Like, I think you almost need to, to pick and choose your moments. It's, it's, it, I'd say it's exactly the same as the efforts you would have put in as a professional athlete. Uh, we as sports viewers, you know, the exact same level of exertion. You can't, you oh, can't it's big decisions. It's like, when you used to get, it's like when I used to get a match day on, go down for the like, buffet breakfast, and I'd be like, Roy, scramble eggs, poached. Oh, which, way, which way do I go? Do I have a sausage? Don't I? Am I going to get that Emmy system in time for kickoff? No. Massive decisions. I yeah. must say, eggs, eggs only and brown bread. Pudding, pudding. No, keep away can't. from the pudding. Keep away. You're not. It's not Irish pudding. You're talking the UK here, which nah. yeah doesn't count. Fair to you. Yeah, exactly. No blood in it. So you're right. Oh, massive decisions constantly during my life. It's never stopped. You know, this you know life changing decisions constantly I've had to make. Uh, well, did look, you ever play? Go on. Sorry, did you ever play a game after a sausage? <laughs> No, I made a mistake uh, early in my career, I haven't, because I used to get up, lads used to be, obviously not to go off on a tangent, but lads used to come up, have a light breakfast, and then come down for a pre-match, say about half 12 um, uh, for the three o'clock kickoff. But I remember when I first rocked up 18, 19 from, from Dublin, any free fr food put in front of you, that was it, like whoosh, good luck, you never knew when you're going to eat again. So, but that, the pre-match, that kind of chicken and beans, like a half 12, I remember the first time I uh, went through that and thinking, 10 minutes into the game thinking, oh, well, that's not, this isn't going to work. So I had to row it back. So uh, I was the exception. I used to come down and literally eat as much as I could at breakfast. I'd literally be attached myself to the buffet for about an hour in the morning and eat as much as I could. Cereal, fruit, croissants, poached eggs, toast, the lot. Get it all on board and then that, that'd be me done before kickoff. That'd be kind of five, six hours before kickoff. So that was the best way. That was the best way forward for me. The beans and chicken at half twelve. Oh, I had to go. Yeah, I mean that was pretty stable. A lot of players will tell you that's a stable, a stable uh, kind of pre-match kind of routine. A couple of hours before, but it didn't suit me. I didn't like that feeling. You know that kind of feeling. You know, when you're sitting in your armchair on, you've had a big, you know, a big pizza all to yourself. You're patting the, you're patting the tummy, thinking, oh, oh, oh. I really enjoy it. That's not the kind of feeling you want going on to a, no. a football, a football Up against pitch. Paulo Decanio or, yeah. uh, or David Beckham. You need to be matter. hungry. Yeah. You need to be hungry. Okay, fair enough. 087 980 180 is the number. If you want to get in touch with us this morning, you can use the hashtag OTBAM as well. We haven't talked about the Tour de France and Sam Bennett coming home in green. What, a, what an amazing finish Saturday and Sunday. So there was a change in the yellow jersey on Saturday with um, one of the most dramatic finishes that we've seen basically since Greg LeMond beat Laurent Fignon all those uh, years ago uh, since. And then on Sunday, it couldn't have finished any better. Sam Bennett actually wins the stage on the Champs-Élysées and there, is, there has begun to be great video doing the rounds. So this is from uh, Tip FM. This is 89-year-old Pat Cashin, Sam Bennett's grandfather, watching the dramatic final moments. Have a look at this. This is from Tip FM. Oh, it's just about 500 minutes to go. This is it, Come on, Sam. 
Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Come on, Sam. Turns green into joy. <laughs> yes, yes. Yay! Yay! That was Go on, to witness. He tried when he oh, was on the stage for the first that time. Was some yes! He'll be trying again at the end of this. Yes! yes. It's a cathartic moment for him. And the first Irishman oh, since Sean Kelly. What a wonderful finale. What a lovely shot. Of course, when we have our sprinter, we also have the the curtain's drawn. It's class, isn't it? Ah, it's lovely that. It's amazing. It's great. It'd be great for uh, Sam Bennett to see that. I stare at the moments you don't appreciate. You're so focused. You're in it. Obviously, you're in the moment and whatever. You're far removed from family and friends. But it's the enjoyment they get from. I think it's going to mean just as much for him when he sees those uh, pictures. It's, it's funny. It's, it's obviously a new experience over the last ten years as uh, camera phones started to come back. That you got to see the families of people celebrating. Yeah. And also, specific to COVID, we're seeing a lot more now because families would be at the thing. So nobody's filming Sam Bennett's family at the Tour de France finish line because they'd well, all be there, you know? They, they uh, would all have yeah. been there. So Absolutely. we get to see some fairly remarkable stuff uh, from this as well. Owen, oh, um, you've been a cycling fan ever since uh, Skoda <laughs> bought your loyalty a couple of years ago by giving you a green jersey. Uh, little did you know that it would be the very same green jersey that Sam Bennett was romping home in. It's uh, the, the similarities really are endless uh, between myself and uh, Sam Bennett this morning. It, it was pretty amazing. Like what, what's remarkable about that is that this still would have been an incredible day for Sam Bennett, even if he didn't win that stage yesterday. It was just the cherry on the top that he's constantly delivering throughout this uh, season's Tour de France, where he got the stage win in the middle of week two. He got the stage win on the Champs Elysees. These are the individual moments that we can all identify as the guy crossing the line first. I mean, like for a lot of people, they might have been working during the days. They might not have seen the intermediate sprint every day. But yesterday, actually seeing this very tangible thing of an Irishman in green crossing the line first on the Champs Elysees is a very crystal moment. Uh, of sport and it will probably go down as one of the, the best Irish sporting moments of this year and Sam Bennett will be in with a shout for all, all those awards that it co comes with individual sports people and this is a, a new dawn for him as well everybody in cycling will have considered him a household name but in sport in Irish sport perhaps that now happens for him uh, and, and this is the moment where it happens for him and like you see that video there from Tip FM it's fantastic his, his family seem like fantastic people uh, like uh, I saw them on, on the news last night with uh, stains down their t-shirt from the bubbly that they were uh, celebrating with uh, last night and all that it's, they just seem like brilliant uh, people and um, the story is remarkable as well from his father being a professional footballer around the continent to uh, the I guess the tough times he's had on the bike as well as an amateur as a professional and it really does feel like a, a story of redemption and kind of a, a story of how you can uh, I, I guess if you work unbelievably hard you can probably put yourself in with a, a chance of achieving something great and that's what Sam Bennett did yesterday. Yeah, somebody tweeted us a picture of uh, him winning um, a stage in the, it must have been the race Talchin, in Scaries. And it looked like it was about six years ago. Maybe it's a bit longer, maybe it's nine years ago at this point. Um, but you think about that journey from there to the Champs Elysees, and it is fairly remarkable. And again, because he's, he's young enough that there is now a period over the next couple of years where this is stratospheric levels or you know he'll be much in demand the next time his contract becomes available everybody will want to he's won the green jersey in the tour de france it is a life changing three weeks that he's been through so um really looking forward to talking to him a little bit later on in the show if you have any questions for him you can uh, whatsapp us here 087 9180 180 as well we should talk about leinster uh, we're all cycling fans now on isn't that it we're like the bike shops are sold out so <laughs> We're not really rugby country, we're cycling country, and you know, <laughs> nobody, I had a text from a friend of mine who's a rugby fan going, oh, I always preferred football anyway at the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, like I mean, if, if the cycling boom didn't need uh, any added incentive, it's uh, uh, somebody winning a, a section of the Tour de France for us, considering, I'd say the bike shops were already, already out of bikes, given lockdown and everything like that, but yeah, Leinster is, uh, it's fairly remarkable, isn't it, how there is a sense of repetition about how Irish teams are going up against English teams and not coming away with the spoils. Uh, it's uh, like it, it does seem like a, a deja vu when it comes to the last few England games, in particular at Six Nations level, and the first half of Leinster against Saracens on Saturday. Uh, it, it's hard to separate these two things at this point, isn't it? 
Have Ireland ever beaten Billy Vinopola? Oh, God, I, I don't know. Is there, not in any recent... In, in recent uh, memory, all I have is Billy Vinopola rocking up against Irish people and just knowing he's going to crush them. Every single <laughs> uh, Irish fellow who comes his way, he just knows he's going to floor him and he'll have a significant win. Like Maybe in many ways, like Leinster will say, uh, well, Ireland got absolutely destroyed by England every time they played. At least we almost beat them in the second half. And it would have been... Uh, obviously Northampton level of comeback had they done it in the second half because on the evidence of the first half they didn't deserve it whatsoever like I definitely believe that because they play in the Pro 14 they're going to go into some games undercooked when they go into Europe I don't think uh, the league is in a good place that they, or it's as good as perhaps some people make it out to be I, I think obviously there's been a lot of failings in Munster over the last little while and how you know putting up three points against Leinster for example is a fairly miserable return given the attacking options that they have is, is that the preparation that Leinster need before going into a game against Saracens potentially not but of course they had Ulster last week as well in a, in a big final and maybe like I'm clinging to that excuse a little bit too much for Leinster but I definitely think premiership teams are coming from a stronger league and that can't hurt them uh, when, when it comes to these big games and the, these first half of the big games anyway. Yeah, it wasn't good news for anybody involved in Irish rugby. It wasn't good news for the Pro 14, the other teams, the other Irish teams. It wasn't good for Leinster that they were so far off the pace in that first half that it was essentially game over. They, you know, they got it back to a single score, but ultimately they were exhausted by the effort of getting it back to a single score. And they just, all the things that they were supposed to have, you know, strength and depth, but they had no strength and depth in the front row. And uh, their, their tight five are coming in for unbelievable levels of criticism. We're going to read the player ratings a little bit later on when we talk to Alan Quinlan too. So a chastening experience for Irish rugby. Um, and uh, that opening 40 minutes is going to live in infamy from uh, Leinster's fans' perspective. Uh, again, we'll do that in more detail later on. 087-9-180-180 um, for the comments. And we've got Alan Quinlan coming back with us a little bit later on. But let's talk football. Kenny is with us because uh, what an incredible weekend of football it was. <laughs> I mean, where the hell do we start? The problem is that everybody is seeing so much of this now, whereas, like, you know, you'd watch Match of the Day and see the highlights, but every game being on means that there's actually talking points. Is that right? Is, are people, this is my point, are people actually watching? I mean, I'd hazard a guess even football supporters are struggling to get through maybe 50%. 50% to to 50%. <laughs> yeah, you're, a right, actually. You're, you're right, actually. I mean, yeah, it's it used true, to be two true. games a weekend, and now it's like four, I'd say, a lot of people are getting to it. Uh, maybe four is too many, but there's always there's always like flick it on. It's like I just it's don't there. know what to make at this stage. They, they kind of the game's being divvied up over the I don't know field Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Initially, you're looking and you think, oh great, great opportunity to watch all this football. It's perfect, yakky the yak. But I don't know. I, I'm a little deflated to be honest. Uh, uh, six o'clock Saturday evening, you know, traditional Saturday, the three o'clock. You, you're back home six, and suddenly you've only it's only we've only had one result. You know, it's barely even begun. You have to get deep into Sunday evening, Monday before you get a little bit of a flavour in terms of how the football and weekend's gone. Like it's a strange one. Well, and also it was madness. There was too many four threes. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, Owen would have enjoyed. He's a big American for NFL basketball. He loves the big, the big scores, the big points. You're right supposed, up on you're street. Right, a, right up on street. You're supposed to have a four three once every four or five years, and it becomes such a big thing because it happens. And, and now it's like I twice know. in a weekend. Yeah, and Everton, again, I watched the Everton game. I hadn't seen their first game against Tottenham, so I really wanted to see that one um, uh, Saturday, the early kickoff Saturday. And that was just, again, just an explosion of goals uh, as well. It all went off. I mean, they played really well, Everton, from an attacking point of view. Big controversial moments, obviously, they sending off, etc. But, yeah, so there you go. That was a far, far cracker from the very start. Seven goals in the early kickoff. Are, are you then picking Liverpool versus Chelsea as your game of the weekend then, considering the goal <laughs> No, I did say to Jay, I was a little bit of a damn squibbage, uh, squib. No, uh, not for the reason maybe uh, you're saying, oh, because um, I just felt the actual quality wasn't of the level that I was expecting in the uh, Liverpool-Chelsea game. You know, where, where, I'm not exactly sure what it was, just a little tepid for me. I know the kind of the sending off kind of skewed it a little bit, but even up to that point, oh, and do you know what I mean? It was decent kind of from a defensive point of view. Chelsea's defensive shape was kind of solid and... Liverpool found it difficult to break it down. They, they, you know, they counted quite well on one or two occasions. Chelsea, Werner had a couple of great opportunities in the first half for me. He kind of got Fabinho in almost 1v1 situations and didn't take advantage of it. Showed a little bit of lack of confidence. It was strange, really. Uh, and they kind of Liverpool survived that. And, of course, after back of the centre half, that was the end of it. But I've no problem with a uh, nil-all. Like, and and I, I, I honestly do. I'm trying to... 
it's difficult for me to separate it, the kind of gluttony of goal zone and the kind of, you know, all the forwards going off. There's some great goals, some excellent attack and play, and I do appreciate that. But if it's not complemented uh, by some really solid uh, collective defending and individual defending, for me it's just, it's very difficult to actually quantify how good the attack and play is. I'll always stick to that. One complements the other. And if the, the, the quality of the defender is not up to the level required, collectively and individually, for me, that just skews the whole picture in terms of the quality of the game. And I think we've mm. seen a little bit of that in the opening couple of weekends of the season. Why is that? Hey. I, I, is there, I, my theory is that the players are taking more chances because there are no crowds to give out about stuff and players are less up for these games. In, a, in the, 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 Psychologically, it feels like a training session. So they're trying stuff that they try in training and it's, uh, it's easier for them, there's less giving out, there's less, nah, you know, like, and that's why... I know the point you're making, I don't agree with it, uh, to be honest with you. And your first point in terms of taking more chances, I, I think you've got, there's merit in that in terms of how teams are looking to play, uh, generally speaking, playing out from the back, even under pressure, that, that invites a huge amount of pressure and a lot of, um, ask some serious questions in terms of your technical abilities of defending your ball playing skills, so I think some defenders are coming up short in that respect. But no, in terms of the basic, the fundamentals of defending, how you defend your area of the pitch up against your man, your decision-making in terms of when to squeeze, when to drop into space, when to cover a run, when to step up, when to pass a man, when to stay on your feet, when to go to ground, when to head a kick it, all of those, all the basics of kind of defending. That's where I'm seeing a lot of mistakes. And for me, that's nothing to do with how many people are inside the stadium. That's just out now ranked defending. You mentioned there, Kenny, that Chelsea's opportunities yesterday came from, I guess, semi-hopeful balls over to the, over the top to target the pace of Timo Werner, and he potentially lacked a bit of confidence in your view. Is it not a case that Fabinho was just possibly the best player in the pitch up until the sending off yesterday? Is that not the fact of the matter here? Because Werner's been OK the first couple of games, except when Fabinho's had him in his pocket. No, I wouldn't go that far. I think that's a, a stretch. I think Fabinho played well, showed his versatility uh, stepping in at, uh, se uh, at centre-half. But the, the one kind of small area of weakness in that Liverpool team, yes, it was probably Fabinho in terms of his lack of mobility, his athleticism, and maybe the ability of Chelsea to get down the side. And that may have been a reason why he played Werner off the left. He played Havertz as a false number nine and Mount off the right. Not too many people saw that. So I think he just felt... Uh, Werner just driving into the space between in behind Alexander Arnold could maybe and expose Fabinho a lot. Now Chelsea didn't have a huge amount of possession on in terms to continually get him possession in the right areas of the pitch. But when they broke and they won back possession on kind of turnovers, that was the ball they looked to hit really. Werner uh, in behind Trent Alexander Arnold and he kind of fronted Fabinho up a couple of times in the first kind of half an hour on the edge of the box. But for me, it wasn't so much a lack of confidence. Maybe Owen just kind of uh, made the wrong decision. You could tell he was a little bit reluctant to drive. A couple of times, I think he should have driven a uh, pass for, for being on the outside. He looked to shift it back in onto his uh, right foot. There was a bit of indecision there. And Fabinho smothered him once and uh, Van Dijk, I think, came across and doubled up uh, and the opportunity went. So, yeah, I think uh, Fabinho had a, had, a, had a fine game and, and fair play to him, but just felt in those key moments in the first half, Wenger just needed to be more clinical in, in his decision-making more so than anything else. It's interesting because, uh, I guess, after the Leeds game, there was definitely a sense that Liverpool now need to go out to the market and sign a centre-back uh, ASAP for the sort of covering situation of Joe Gomez not being there. Do you think that with Thiago in the midfield, that's uh, an extra option in midfield, Fabinho can then just be this versatile cover because, as you say, he did have a fine game? Yeah, no, you're right. I think that's the reason why he allowed Lovren uh, to go and he hasn't actually replaced him on because he looks and he thinks, so I've got Van, Dijk, uh, Van Dijk Gomez, Matt Seep is my next option. And then obviously, yeah, who's me forward choice? Because it is possible you lose two of your centre halves as they have done. And then he obviously looked at Fabinho and thought, I trust him. If he needs to step in, I trust him. He can go in there and do a job, which he did yesterday. So that's the reason why he hasn't kind of spent on that kind of squad addition in terms of a centre half. Uh, yeah, the Tiago one's going to be an interesting one on going forward. I'm, I'm st I still scratch my head a little bit at it. I think the squad is strengthened by his arrival. But for me, they've spent kind of 30 million on a tour choice number six. That's what he is. Right. He doesn't play ahead of Henderson or Fabinho for me in that hold of midfield. But you're not picking the team. So Klopp's going to pick him ahead of him, right? Oh, of, course, of, course, of course Klopp's going to pick him. Yeah, I'm not Liverpool so manager. He's not, but he's not, he's not a third choice then. They've, they've, they, in my opinion. But, it, but he, thinks, he thinks he's an improvement as a number six, right? On Henderson and Fabinho. Yeah, that's what, that's what it looks like. 
Now, so I think Owen's going to make. Well, maybe I week. haven't heard. I haven't heard. I've never. I haven't heard uh, Klopp come out and say he's going to be. This, I bought him as my first choice uh, number six. Like I said, I, I think he's inferior to Fabinho and Henderson in that holding uh, midfield position. That's why I'm surprised he brought him in. I probably said it like a month ago when they, they were linked with him. I said, I can't really see this one. I said because he'll strengthen the squad, experienced player, good technician, decent football. I saw a bit of that yesterday although he was under no pressure. But what we saw also yesterday was deficiencies defensively. We saw the number of missed tackles he made. I was we, saw the penalty, we saw the penalty give away. I was listening to commentary. I can't believe he didn't do it. I told you so, because it sounded like you, uh, you, were, you were pointing out how his tackle technique isn't great, and then five minutes later he gives away a penalty, and you're like, I did point out his tackle technique is well, not so good. Well, you've got to call it as you see it. Like I said, I think he's a very good footballer. We didn't say, actually see how good a footballer he was yesterday, because Chelsea just backed off and let him have the ball. He's worked around the pitch. He's actually a good, ba- uh, good ball player in tight areas, even when the pressure comes on. He's a good technician. Yeah. But it, for me, he, he's weak defensively. He is so, weak defensively. Oh, and you had a theory that he's not actually a six at all. Yeah, well, like, I definitely feel that, like, to read David Myler on Friday, and he said it could be Fabinho versus Thiago. I wonder, just on the evidence of yesterday, if that's going to be the battle at all, that Fabinho is a far superior player at the base of uh, a midfield three, that if Liverpool do want to go to two sixes that are perhaps more advanced, then Thiago clearly is the outstanding option in that position. I know they don't play a number 10, but something just a little bit deeper than that, some, a, a player to unlock the defence from central areas, he looks like he can do that better than Wijnaldum, better than Henderson, better than Fabinho. No, I disagree with you there. I mean, Liverpool play like yeah, Liverpool play with a six and two eight on that kind of inverted triangle in, mid, in, in midfield. Now, predominantly, he's played in the base of that for the last kind of year at Bayern Munich. That's where people have seen him play. So I, I've, I've given me opinion in terms of where I see him. I see him as third choice in the Liverpool team behind Henderson and Fabinho in that position. So I think it is a fair argument. During his career, he's also played as one of those advanced positions as to, those two uh, kind of number eights. But for me, at this stage of his career, I don't think that's where he's most effective. And I don't think, again, I don't think he gets in the Liverpool team ahead of Wijnaldum, uh, Oxide chamberlain Keita, or even Curtis Jones in those two advanced... Uh, mm. Yeah, no, in those but two advanced why positions. Why this stage of his career? It's a pasting? Yeah, I think it is. Or? I think it is. And I think it's the same with Jordan Henderson a little bit. Henderson has been used as a, one of those advanced number eights and a six. And he's played in the team with Fabina because of his versatility. Fabina can just play at the base. But Henderson, over the next couple of years, you're going to see he's going to, he's going to cover that number six role because in terms of his legs, his energy levels, athleticism that he has, that's good. there's going to be a little bit of a drop-off there. So he's going to be looking to play just by a natural evolution. He's going to be looking to play the holding midfield position a little bit more as well. So I just think Thiago's totally squeezed out there. I think he will get game time, don't get me wrong. Um, to a certain extent, Champions League cup games and certain league games, but that's the bit you saw it snaps a sh- uh, shot of it yesterday. In that game, they're the man, they're the man sparing that game yesterday, and he was asked a couple of questions defensively, and he just hadn't got the answers. I mean, that challenge he made for the penalty, that's like Matt, you can't just close your eyes to that. That was like a centre midfielder, hair and back, full pelt, just not seeing a clear picture in his head, stumbling into the back. That just. That just can't happen like that. That kind of decision making, really, the alarm bells are screaming there. If I'm a manager or a player and I'm seeing that, I'm thinking, wow, when the big games come along, when it really kind of matters, when we need somebody there who we can trust, be disciplined, see danger, sense danger, and go and deal with it, make good decisions, when to stay on your feet, when to go to ground, and, and actually how to tackle. I don't think technically he actually understands how to tackle. I've seen it, not just yesterday. I've seen it with him over the last couple of years. I've, I mean, I watch a lot of the continental football. A German football as well, and he actually struggles to technically. What he does, and what you find of people who can't, not very good tacklers, they panic. They actually jump into tackles. They go to ground both feet. They lunge in because that's the easiest thing to do. The hardest thing to do is stay in your feet, position your body, your upper body, and actually under, understand the art of actually defending, using your body, and your, getting your body in front of people to actually nudge them out. All these little small little um, uh, skills which you need. So I don't want to talk him down too much. Like I said, he's got, he's got some, some wonderful attributes. If you'd have said to me, if you'd have said to me a month ago, we might have had a conversation about Liverpool, where do they need to strengthen? I said, they don't need to strengthen the first 11. I said, periphery of the squad, yeah, absolutely. But one player, if you'd have said Liverpool got £70 million to spend uh, a, a month ago, how do you spend it? In a heartbeat, I would have said Havertz. Spend all of it and get Havertz to the football club. Because Havertz goes straight into this Liverpool team for me at the moment as a number eight and actually improves the, improves the team. Well, Thiago well, doesn't. And Diego, I think, is a very good boy. But he'll only supplement that uh, front three in the, in the short term. 
how, how can we look so good then when he was on the ball? Like, uh, it, it, there has to be, other than them having the extra man, like, you can't Oh, you can't. No, you back. can't, though. You can't judge him. I think he's a very good football. I'm not, I'm not going to judge him on yesterday. Every time he got the ball, there was 10 yards of space in front of him. So you can't judge him on that. But he is a fair... But like I'm saying is, he actually can play under pressure in Toy Air. He's a good player, playing the half tour, and good, good vision, works the ball quickly, kind of one-two touch on him. He's a good... Pa he's a decent passer of the ball. But you look at that pass Jordan Henson played for the, for, the, for the sending off. Jordan Henderson is as good as anybody in terms of his long-range pass. And a couple of goals Liverpool scored last year, Henderson picking the ball up deep, deep in that massive diag over opposition defenders. Remember a goal at Bournemouth, I think it was Mane who scored it as well. So Henderson, for me, in terms of his long-range pass, and he doesn't get enough credit, is as good as anything. Um, Thiago's a better technician than Her Henderson, can sort his lower centre of gravity, sorts his feet out quicker, one-two touch, can play uh, better in tight, congested areas than Jordan Henderson. So... This, this, is, this is all I'm saying. It's not a personal thing. It's just what I've observed, not off yesterday, but over like the last couple of years, what I've seen out of Thiago. And I'd ask Liverpool supporters and people are saying, well, what amazing signing. If you had to pick between Henderson, when, uh, Fabinho or Thiago in that holding midfield position, who would it be? I mean, would you, would you agree, supposedly with Klopp's jersey saying that Thiago is going to be in your starting eleven? I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if that was the case. Like... One of the things that we've seen from Klopp is that he changes the style, there's an evolution, so at the start it was go, 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 all go, and then they changed into a team that would like to keep the ball for a while and were, were able to win games differently. Is there an evolution here? Is that what he's trying to do, to get somebody in the team who's going to keep the ball yeah. a bit more? I think it's a fair point. If, that, if you're looking for that type of player, that kind of quarterback, that kind of Pirlo figure, uh, own in, that, in that, uh, that base in that number six position, so you're really kind of, you're looking to play more of a possession-based game and, and be more maybe proactive, more clinical in terms of your passing from deeper areas. Yeah, absolutely. But what's the, what's the trade-off? The trade-off is you're putting a player in that area of the pitch you can't defend. Well, do you put him then, do you put somebody beside him so it's two sixes and an eight? Oh, well, but that's a total, eights. that is a total transformation to Liverpool. <laughs> Liverpool have very rarely, Jordan Klopp's reign, deviated from that kind of midfield, that inverted triangle, the deep line six and the two eights. Very rarely that's happened. He's only really changed when he's chasing the game in the past. And he's had to sacrifice one of those three midfielders and bring a fourth forward on. I think they could actually, I'd like to see a little bit more of that actually. When I look at Minamino, I think for me he's almost a number 10. He's a very clever little player. And I think possibly uh, this year at times we'll see Liverpool flip to a two. A bit like you were saying, Jay, get an, or an orthodox midfield too. And someone like Minamino playing behind Firmino. That's an in interesting little dynamic, but I don't think it'll happen week to week. That, that, that's quite a serious shift in terms of how you play, your kind of patterns of play, etc. Yeah, like it just, uh, I guess after the penalty as well, Kenny, yes, it, there is an intervention in the Liverpool box about 10 minutes later where he takes the ball off, off Werner's foot. Like, I, I mean, if, if we're going to take away credit for the fact that Chelsea are down to 10 men for this, we also probably need to give Thiago credit for the fact that he joined the club 48 hours before the match. Like, getting used to his teammates, getting used to his surroundings. Like, I think in fairness, there, there probably needs to be a little bit of an, an allowance for a little bit of a lapse like that. I don't think we can just... No, I'm not. I'm, I'm not uh, my opinion, is, I'm not forming my opinion what I saw yesterday. I'm forming my opinion what I've seen over the last three or four years. I've seen enough of them play. This isn't what, just off the back of what I saw in half an hour yesterday. That was just a snapshot for me yesterday of what I've seen of them over a very over a longer period of the time. And like I said, like every player, he's got his strengths and weaknesses. But I always get, in terms of how Liverpool play, how defensively strong they are, like when they go hunting the ball, that kind of high press, whatever it is, mid press, whatever they do, everybody switched on, everybody's aggressive, everybody makes good decisions, angle of approach, how to tackle, that type of thing. There's been a real kind of physical element to Liverpool's team. Once you start introducing players like uh, Thiago, for me, you kind of dilute that a little bit. Is there a trade-off in terms of what you gain? Possibly so. But for me, Liverpool's success, Liverpool haven't had to play with a, with a, with a number, like a quarterback in that in number six position in terms of su success they've had on. So well, if it ain't broke, you know, don't fix it. That's how I see it. I just think improve on what you've got. The fundamentals are already in place there. Can you improve on it in certain areas? And someone like Havertz for me, we mightn't see him maybe in the first couple of months at Chelsea. He's playing out of position uh, at the moment. But for him, very quickly, he can offer you, for me, 10, 15 plus goals easily from that central midfield position where kind of the likes of Keita and Wijnaldum are operating. So for me, he was the one. I think they've, they've missed the trick a little bit, Liverpool. In terms, Ronaldo's talking about maybe Barcelona might bring, uh, uh, take him there. And there's good cover there, Oxley chamber Of course, Jones, I'm a fan of, don't get me wrong. So I'm, I'm just, uh, like I said, I'm not saying they've made bad decisions in terms of their, their signings. Jota, I think, uh, absolutely fine signing. 
uh, when you look at it in its own merits. But the Thiago one for me, no, I've, I've had my reservations for the reasons that I've said. Well, let, let's talk about Havertz then. Um, Chelsea, you know, you were making the point in, in commentary yesterday that this isn't their full team. We're not ready to judge them just yet, that you'd like to see a midfield. I think it was uh, Kante, Havertz and was it Pulisic? Mount. Mount. They, they were your midfield trio. And we're, we're a bit away from actually seeing exactly what this team can do just yet. And again, players still coming in at this point. So not overreacting to a Chelsea defeat where... You know they're in the game until the sending off. Um, how how close are they to competing for the title this season? Yeah, not not obviously with the, that team that was on the pitch yesterday. But you put that kind of six that that I spoke with there, that midfield. The problem with uh, Chelsea will have, in same comparison to Liverpool, even when you put that front three on the pitch, say Pulisic, uh, Wenger, and and Ziyech, they probably can contribute in terms of goals. What the Liverpool front three do, but that midfield three potential with Mount and Havertz are absolutely key and I think Lampard recognises that I think that's why he spent big on Havertz I think he knows his two number eights need to contribute 20 plus goals between them 20-25 goals to supplement those goals I don't think any of those front three necessarily are going to be prolific so Havertz potentially for me can do that and Mason Mount as well and those kind of central advanced central uh, midfield areas and then you've got the counterbalance of Kante and the holding uh, position I'd make the same argument with Jorginho again we've had the conversation for me he can't play there Chelsea won't win a title with Jorginho G- in, 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 in that area of the pitch for, the, for his deficiencies defensively as well. Kante, for me, complements, counterbalances the attacking qualities of Mount and Havertz. That's why I think that's, that's, that's quite beautiful, that midfield three. But the problems are going to be further down the park in terms of that, that partnership at centre-half and the whole kind of defensive unit plus goalkeeper. That's the, still the big question mark about this Chelsea team. When was the Is last the time N'Golo Kante played six uh, con- Consistently, because it's two managers ago now, is it? No, but th- this is it's interesting. I've looked at Lampard since he's been at the football club, and he's clearly wrestled with this because straight in he came in and straight. I spoke to a few people at Chelsea, and they told me he's a huge fan of Jorginho because he wants this type of player in that number six for the reasons maybe you're saying. Maybe Klopp's looking to a bit of an evolution at Liverpool and get uh, Alicantra in there. Somebody who can receive the ball off the centre half and full backs on the half tour and get look forward quick and punch those little 10, 15 yard balls, break the lines. Yeah, uh, quick switches of play, all that type of thing. And Georgina, to an extent, can do that, as, Tia- uh, as Thiago can. But again, it's the flip. But by doing that, he's pushed Kante into advanced position, which I think he's done OK with, but I don't think best suits uh, his strengths. But I just think, uh, as a result, as well, Chelsea, Chelsea have been porous in that area of the pitch as well. It's been a problem for them. Uh, that's when they haven't got the ball and they're having to defend and trust Jorginho to do a defensive job in that area of the pitch. He's just not capable of doing it. So my, my, I would put Kante, you're right, there's a bit of noise around Kante, I don't understand it, maybe there's something we don't know. Yeah, that's Talking about like, him being it? linked, there's something going on, there's that COVID thing, it, it was a little bit of what he's now, he can't, he's not, he's not available, there's some family issues, so there might be something behind the scenes there, maybe so, yeah, but I think physically the way he moves around the pitch and just his experience and his qualities, for me all day, maybe this, again it's just personal preference, doesn't mean, I'm not saying I'm right, I'm just saying this is how I see it, for me it's Kante all day in that uh, early the pitch to complement those other players he can't play, no way he can play Jorginho, Havertz, say, and Mount in that midfield three. You forget it. You forget about any thoughts of winning the title with that midfield three. It's totally our, our kill to our balance. But um, yeah, that, that's, that's, the, that's the questions he'll have to wrestle with Lampard over the next couple of weeks in terms of if he goes and jumps again in the transfer mark, which I think he, he could well do. To get what in the transfer market? When a, a centre half stroke hold the midfielder, maybe so. As I've mentioned Declan Royce before, that may not happen to be fair, just, just may not happen for a number of reasons. But uh, I don't see a natural partner for, for Thiago. And there's question marks over Thiago. People think Thiago's going to hit the ground run, he's going to be bossing everything back there, he's going to be untouchable. That may not be the case. He might struggle a little bit in terms of the pace and what he's up against. Same as, as well. Kenny. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you look at. You look, Tamori's the one I think potentially could could step up, but he might need another year's experience somewhere else before he's ready. So, yeah, so a lot, lot of grounds for excitement, but, but Chelsea fans are going to have to be careful because at the moment, that's the balance is not right in the team. They just cannot get their best players on the pitch. It, it does seem that any optimism of a three-horse race was a little bit misplaced from the start of the season, Kenny, and Manchester United's performance on Saturday night uh, is a factor in that. There's going to be so many complaints made about Ed Woodward, tweets about Manchester United over the, the next couple of days saying they need to sign this player or that player. But the fact of the matter, I'm sure you think, is that if you have these players already at your disposal, you shouldn't be getting beaten by Crystal Palace at home. 
Well, no, I think you've been a bit disrespectful to Crystal Palace. I'd say that I understand the point you're making now, and don't get me wrong, but I'm a big fan of Hearts and how he sets his team up, the counter attack on football, which they play home and away, and how effective they are, you know, play, playing to your strengths and getting the very maximum out of what you've got. That's the essence of coaching and management, and Hudson does that better than most. Now, you can talk a lot, Manchester United, about what uh, fa Manchester United fans, what they have and kind of haven't got, who they need in what areas. But again, I'd make the argument, was that the best for the players on the pitch at the moment? Was that the best performance you could have expected from those Manchester United players on the pitch? And the answer was no. Really yeah. surprised me. I raced back to watch that game um, after covering the 3 o'clock game. I was looking forward to it, and it really took me back into how tepid they were. Manchester United it really took me back on. I was really expecting to be energised, that kind of front three, Fernandez, Pogba, that front five really I've spoken about potentially that could be the best in the world. I know David James played, Greenwood didn't play, that was a slight surprise, but just generally speaking, just a little bit off the pace, a bit kind of nerve, that nervous tension crept into the play defensively, they're probably as bad as I've seen them play. We know there's issues there on in terms of strength in the back four, but I'd have to say yesterday was the first time People have been talking about need a good centre half to play alongside Harry Maguire. Absolutely, possibly even strengthen one of the a bit of covering the full back areas. Yeah, absolutely. But after that performance, yes, it was the first time I've looked at it and thought, do you know what? They might have to be braver here, and it might take a different manager to come into the football club and and tear the whole thing up from a defensive point of view, and and start again with two top class centre halves, a top class partnership, two of them, and and break up the partnership of uh, Maguire and Lindelof, both of them. Because Harry Maguire now is getting to the stage, I'm looking at him, and as good as he is in terms of ball playing ability, he kind of very dominant in both boxes in terms of early, powerful header of the ball. But it's becoming more and more obvious, the higher Manchester United get up the pitch, the more questions he's asked to defend in 1v1 situations and turn and run those channels in behind. He's it's, it's, it's a real struggle for him because of his physical makeup bone. And it's cost him, you know, it goes over the last season. It hasn't been spoken about too much. It's been, well, you know, he's made a mistake, but, you know, he's the man, he's the leader, he's our captain, he's the kind of way forward. But the more mistakes he continues to make, the more the argument is going to grow, even amongst Manchester United supporters, that, you know what, we may have to go again. We may have to bite the bullet, potentially, uh, uh, Harry Maguire, and go and get two centre-halves who with a different type of DNA you know, uh, great, good athletes, you know, powerful runners, good in 1v1 situations. You can afford to send your full-backs up the pitch now and you're not going to get caught out counter-attack with the likes of Zaha, you know, Townsend running in behind because you'll have centre-halves. You've got the pace to deal with that ball over the top and are good in 1v1 situations and are kind of rocks all their strengths really are in the defensive aspects of their game. They may not be the best ball players in the world. It may not be at Harry's level in terms of their productivity in terms of playing the ball forward at the midfield and making a contribution higher up the pitch but you can trust them you can trust them out of possession in terms of their ability to defend their half of the pitch so that's probably the first time yesterday I got a bit of a sense of that watching that United back forward thinking do you know what it may not just be another centre half to play alongside Maguire it may need a total overhaul and given the financial outlay of Maguire this is like an Alexis Sanchez level of getting it wrong isn't it's it worse. What you're... it's worse it's actually yeah. worse no, I wouldn't say that, Owen. That's too far. Because like I said, he's... But you're I, selling a player who cost, what, 70 million quid after... 75, yeah. You get, you get decent bit back. Look, at this well, is... Yeah, who's going to buy him? No, Sanchez is a bad comparison, to be honest with you, Owen, because I think Sanchez is a, a massive question mark about his kind of attitude uh, uh, and mentality, etc. I'd, I'd never say that. Like, uh, McGuire strikes me as a good character. And I can see the qualities in terms of what he has, why, why he was brought into the... He wouldn't be... I said it from the start, I wouldn't have bought him. I wouldn't have bought him because I looked at McGuire and thought, fantastic football player, very dominant, wills a lot of headers when it comes into his area in the box. He'll score, chip him a half a dozen goals during the season. But you know what? Manchester United team traditionally play on the front foot. They want to play in the opposition half. You know, they send their full backs in the high position. They commit players high up the pitch. And that's put, that puts big pressure on the two centre halves who are stood in the halfway line in terms of, yeah, you're going to have to defend the times. You're going to have to defend 1v1 if you have to. That's the way we play. That's, that's a Manchester United centre half. You've got to be good enough to do that. And I don't think quite. Harry Maguire has never been that type of defender. And he's been exposed a couple of times, like I said already. And I just feel as if. It, 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 it's just how I see it. It's just a good feeling. I just think potentially, you know, if they want to get to the level Liverpool are at, and that's a, you know, it's a high bar, Manchester City as well, you just can't have a chink. You can't have a chink in your army, particularly down the spawn of the team in that central defensive. Uh, position, you know, it's cost Manchester City to a certain extent, particularly in kind of uh, Champions League.
and certainly last season, that little small frailties and that central uh, defensive early of the pitch. And I, I, I sense a little bit that with Manchester United, and it's not just the, the person who's playing alongside Maguire, it's in his makeup as well, Maguire, in terms of his qualities and his small deficiencies. And I just don't feel as if he's, he's the perfect fit for Manchester United in, in that respect. That's a tough thing to say, because I'm a big fan of him in a lot of other respects, character-wise, and the abilities that he has. But I, I just, I'm, I'm at that stage now where I'm thinking, who's going to be brave enough? I don't think Solskjaer will do it while he's at the football club. And he may well buy a top-class centre-half. Who knows, Koulibaly might come in at the last minute. He may buy another top-class um, could, full-back. Could that fix Harry Maguire? Could somebody... It'll help, but it won't fix it. Because even somebody like Koulibaly or an absolute top-class centre, Uwe Meccano's a young player, probably going to develop into that type of player, the excellent player. But he can only help to an extent. It's a left-sided centre-half can't get on a right-sided centre-half's outside shoulder and give cover. He can't make up that type of ground. So at various stages during the game, you're going to have to defend your air to pitch. You're going to have to be good enough. You're going to have to be quick enough to read situations. Not just read. He's a good reader of the game, actually, Maguire. I think he actually reads things very well. But sometimes you haven't got that natural pace, that turn of pace, particularly on the turn. You're going to get found out. We're not overreacting. Obviously, we're one game in. But what you're saying is that it's it would take a miracle for them to win the league with this current setup. Oh, they're not going to win, obviously, at the moment. No, not at the moment. Oh. Yeah. Everybody knows that they're not going to. I mean, I think the front. I think there's the front five. I think potentially, uh, Fernandez and Pop is as good as anything. They can they can put numbers down as good as anything, as good as Liverpool potentially uh, going forward. Small issue in terms of that holding midfielder. Who is it going to be? McTominay played there yesterday. I think potentially he could develop into that type of player, but he, again, has crossed that defensive line. Yeah, could they reinforce with Sancho? Yeah, absolutely. That would reinforce that front three. But again, it's it's across the defensive line. Similar to Chelsea, just in terms of that defensive unit. At least Chelsea went out and bought a fullback, a centre back, and a keeper. Like that's what they did. They were like, we have a problem here. We're going to buy him. We're going to buy him. We're going to buy him. We're going to keep looking. At yeah, we got to play the right play. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It. Yeah, I agree. He, but he, he, question now on Thiago. Certainly on Chilwell for me. I don't, can't understand what pay fifty million on. He's on, English. On, that's on, why. On Chilwell. Yeah, yeah, tax. That's a, that's a, that's not a particularly good reason for me, but. Yeah, but it's huge. I really think it is. It's you know, it's an attacking game. We know it. You know, goals. You're talking about goals every game. We all kind of love it, etc., etc. But for me, there's all, always has to be that balance. The very best teams uh, I've ever seen in European football have always had that outstanding individual players, great attacking units, scored lots of goals, but always counted by that solid defensive uh, base in behind and that defensive mentality um, in, in individual players who understood uh, how how to defend. Uh, let's move on to just a, a couple of final questions, Kenny. We can do these in rapid fire style. Uh, Spurs yesterday, uh, according to your view, would, does Gareth Bale improve that team, that current setup, or does Jose need to tweak things considerably? Oh, he improves across the the. the <laughs> I feel like I can repeat myself across the the, the attacking line now, but he doesn't solve the problems further down the uh, further down the pitch. I think it was interesting. Again, Sun's contribution yesterday was like amazing, but it. He really hurt Southampton down the centre of the pitch on, and I'm always, I'm, inter I'm always interested when I've heard Marino of like screaming about I need a, I need a backup for Kane, I need we need to spend I need I need a, a second number nine. It's too much workload on Harry Kane's shoulders. I, I always scratch my head a little because the answer's within the squad. It's Son. That, that that's your second striker. If you need to take Harry Kane out, you need to put somebody high up the pitch. It's Son. And if you look at some actually some of the a link up play between the two of them it was Kane dropping off into like a deep line number 10 position and Sun driving into the space in behind the two centre halves that caused Southampton all sorts of problems in that second half. So Sun's the answer for me, that's their second number nine. And I think there's actually an argument at times for Sun actually playing ahead of uh, Harry Kane as an out and out number nine and nine in certain games. I think the attributes he has is pace in behind, timing of his runs in behind is something which Harry Kane can give you. Now, Kane's got some other magnificent attributes. The ball he played for Suns for goal yesterday, Alan, was absolutely amazing. Uh, the quality, I, I couldn't, mm. you know, I, I couldn't talk it up enough. So that's great. Bale coming in will help give them more variation there. So I think they have no problems high up the pitch. And yes, I do think Bale will strengthen them when fit, if he's going to be fit for enough games. But Spurs, I could talk about Spurs, we could be talking about the same Chelsea, Manchester United. Um, in terms of uh, defensive uh, qualities as well. Centre half, are they good enough in the centre defensive positions? No. Centre midfield, have they got that, those kind of natural defensive uh, defenders in there, in Winks in particular? No. Hoiberg to a certain extent. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit the same old same when we're talking about Spurs. 
Uh, when it comes to Leeds, I know you were covering them on Saturday. It seems that their biggest critic so far this season has actually been Marcelo Bielsa. He's come out and said the same thing after the first two games, saying we're actually scoring in lucky enough ways that we're, the shots we're putting up actually aren't enough to score the amount of goals that we've been scoring. He's basically saying that this isn't currently sustainable. What do you reckon? Yeah, but he's, I, th I suppose he's saying that, yeah, he'd like more shots on goal, but what you couldn't mm. argue is that they haven't been clinical. Oh, when those yeah. chances they arrived, they were where at Anfield. I don't think you can complain too much by saying, I'm not happy, we're being far too clinical. <laughs> when those chances, that's almost what he's saying, isn't it? Yeah. If you flip it over, but he's right. If you look at the chances yesterday, Helder Costa, first goal was half a chance, brilliant finish. Second goal as well, you know, slightly easier fin, but not easy, not easy top corner again. So that's something to be celebrated. But he's probably right, he probably feels as if I need to create more chance. But again, defensively, you know, you can see four one up, the game should be over. You know, you, you see out the game, you manage the game better. They didn't do that. Uh, Fulham allowed Fulham back into the game. They could have easily have got a draw. But I, w I wouldn't be downbeat in terms of Leeds. What I've seen from Leeds, first half they dropped off a little bit against Fulham in terms of the intensity levels uh, on. And you looked at them and, th and thought, oh, that's this is quite mediocre actually what I'm watching. But as soon as they upped those intensity levels, second half, the pass was more crisper, a little bit more direct. They looked like the Leeds of the previous week against Liverpool. So I'd be very buoyant if I was a Leeds supporter. Uh, in terms of the amount of goals conceded, generally speaking, uh, from what I've seen. But obviously, improvement needs to be made. I'd suggest in the defensive area of the pitch, Costa just come in there, looks as if he's going to need a period uh, of adjustment there at centre half. But uh, no, I think um, I think a good days ahead for, for Leeds this season from what I've seen. And then just a, a final one then on Everton, looking brilliant for the first couple of games. A staff for you here is that James Rodriguez completed zero sprints on Saturday. <laughs> uh, with, with a player of that quality, do you just uh, accept that they're not going to do that and just hope that they are statuesque but brilliant? Yeah, well, I'm going to talk myself down here. Jerry's accused me of talking myself up a little bit later, uh, early on the show, uh, indirectly. So I'm going to have a go at myself here. I questioned the James Rodriguez uh, signing when he came to the football club. For the reasons that you've suggested there, on, I thought, this is a lad who just doesn't run. How do, you, how do you accommodate him in the team? Ancelotti, you know, doesn't generally play with a kind of a number 10, he's going to play him off the flank, but if he plays him off the flank, he won't stay wide, he'll come on the inside, he won't track back. So all of these things, this was the natural discussion with him. But from what I've seen, what I saw Saturday on with him, I, I, I saw the argument, and I think it was fair that, do you know what? He doesn't necessarily track back. He doesn't, he's not going to track the opposition fullback. He's not necessarily going to hold his position wide right of a three, which is where he's been asked to play. But when he drifts onto the inside, into the centre of the pitch, into those little pockets of space, in behind the opposition uh, midfielders and gets the ball, he's going to hurt you. He's, he could take the game away from you. And that's almost what he did to West Bromwich Albion. Got a brilliant strike from that position, drifting into that number 10 position, great goal. And the ball that he played second half to uh, Richarlison would ended up in Cavaloon bundling the ball over. I don't know if you saw the goal, Jer, mm. uh, into the goal. I don't know if you remember Owen. The little kind of scoop pass from about 25, 30 yards there. You're looking at him saying, well, how can he... Where, he needs an Ivan Needle pass. Where's the space to play this pass? And all of a sudden, it's just that, that little scoop one over the top. And it's one of those moments you think, whoa, there's not too many players I can think of actually could have played that pass. So you're right. So you're right in terms of what he's contributing in possession at the moment from an attacking point of view, far outweighs those defensive uh, deficiencies. And I give Ancelotti a lot of credit, and I shouldn't have doubted him because I'm a huge An Ancelotti fan. He's worked with James Rodriguez. He knows him a lot more than me, even in terms of character. He's made the decision to bring him into the football club. He's backed him, and so far, it looks as if it's the right decision. All right. Plenty of more football stories for us to get stuck into over the course of the rest of the week. In the meantime, time for the papers. OTB AM. Uh, here's what's on otbsports.com for you. Have we got that first? If we don't, we can go straight to... Yeah, there it is there. Um, so that's what we have coming up for you this morning. Sam Bennett's grandfather watching his grandson win the green jersey. We played that for you. Uh, these are big challenges for Jonathan Hill coming in. He has to deliver big deals. That's uh, Philip Quinn from the papers yesterday. To do it in green is so special. Sam Bennett's euphoric reaction to winning on the Champs-Élysées yesterday in Liverpool continuing their winning, continue their winning start with victory at Stamford Bridge. Tab of the morning straight off the bat is the Irish Sun for you. Video thrilled the Sadio star. You get it? You get it? And so that was after uh, VAR ended with the red cards, which turned the game yesterday. And Sam's Elise, they were in uh, top form in the sun yesterday. Jose, Delhi's in my plan, but it's not true. He's just, uh, it's definitely not true. The rest of the papers to be believed this morning. The Irish Daily Mirror, perfect, imperfect. And that's the Liverpool game yesterday. Uh, sun, foursome, Kane, awesome. 
but axed Delhi now a target for PSG, apparently. Uh, I have to try and get to the bottom of this story from the tabloid headlines this morning. The star, Dodgy Kepa. So Kepa mistake, obviously, again, not um, uh, suggesting that he's going to be long at Chelsea or certainly in the first team. Green Giant is the picture of Sam Bennett there and a picture of Bryson the champion, Bryson DeChambeau winning the US Open yesterday. Beating the course up and beating the field up with his mega muscles. Another costly Kepa calamity is the back page of the London Times. And they also have doubts over Ali as Spurs eye Lingard. Jesse Lingard. Jesse Mourinho wants to rescue Jesse Lingard from his Manchester United hell of 120 grand a week. The, uh, the Irish Daily Mail back page is Kepa on brink. Chelsea flops, blunder, gifts, reds, victory. And Cullen tells beaten blues to feed off their pain. We'll talk about that pain with um, Alan Quillen in a couple of minutes' time. And Mourinho's squad puzzle. Ali and PSG sites as Spurs shuffle pack. If they can get any money for Deli Ali, you have to take it, right? Because Jose doesn't want it. Uh, I don't know about any money. If you get good enough money, I think, yeah, he'll uh, consider it. What's good enough? 20 million good enough? Oh, no, I, no, I would have thought of 40. Okay. I think there's still a, a player in there if they someone can get inside his head and give him a bit of confidence. Not going to be Mourinho, though, is it? No, it doesn't look like it now. The uh, Telegraph here, Ali and PSG talks after fresh snub. Jose, Jose has an Instagram account where he puts up a picture of Harry Kane after the game. I, di I didn't see this. It's reported in one of the papers. Uh, team players... Something about uh, team players oh, play for the I team. I hate it. I don't know what. I don't know what he's. He's. I think he's lost the plot in terms of managing the players over the past couple of years. Marino. I don't know. I don't know what's occurred, but no. I, I, the top, players wrong team players. top players are team players. That was it. Yeah. What? Like. I mean, look. I, so you've got to talk to people in the platforms that they're on. Maybe Deli Ali sees this and goes, "Oh, okay. This is going to get to me now." I think it's put a, a message up on Instagram, I understand it. I think it's a dreadful thing to do. Obviously, directed at uh, possibly Ali, but I think even from the other players, if I was a colleague of, of Ali in that kind of dressing room, had any kind of feeling towards him, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be pretty sick by that comment as well from the manager. The uh, Irish Examiner this morning, their front page is Sam Bennett greening the Champs Elysees. Um, it's, a, it's a really an incredible achievement, and he looks cool. Uh, Donald Lennon, time for Irish rugby to take stock. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. A couple of weeks now before the um, internationals. Time for people to start thinking about stuff. Klopp can't help smiling in that same picture of Sam Bennett as well. Hope remains for Ireland. Focus on Kiev after Germany defeat. So the Ireland women's national team beat 3-0 at the weekend. We'll talk with Fahi about that in a little while. The Irish Independent. Uh, Klopp hails return of real Reds as Chelsea handed reality check. And there's uh, tears and cheers for Knockmore's final glory. So Isla Kilcoyne crying in the midst of the uh, Knockmore players after they won the Mayo Senior Football Championship yesterday over Brafey. And uh, the Irish Times, so the Irish Indo have a um, sports supplement and there's the two-page spread of Sam Bennett in green on the Sean Delise podium. And then the last one here is the Racing Post. And they say that uh, owners return to Irish courses for the first time at Listowel and Ferry House. That's a, a little breakthrough and Fortress Molyneux. City set for more misery in Wolves' den. This is tonight at 8.15. They're predicting that Man City aren't going to win the game tonight, are they? I mean, surely Man City, because they've got like... Oh, that would be a surprise. That if they win it. If they lose it. Oh, this, this is a Wolves team, a club that's on the, in the ascendancy. They're as well set up as any team in the league. Well coached, tactically. Oh, this is a massive, massive test for Manchester City so early in the season. But they they have to win these games. They've got to start. Oh, I I think you're right. I think it's psychologically it's amazing, isn't it? They haven't even kicked the game. The um, Liverpool by virtue of that uh, win yesterday, I've actually put uh, I'll put a bit of pressure on their shoulders going into this game. It's amazing, but it is there is pressure there. And if they lose it, uh, undoubtedly, um, almost playing catch up is a ridiculous thing to say. Kind of one game into this season, but yeah, so that's but how that's, it was last year. Yeah, yeah, but that's the Liverpool. That's the kind of pressure they're exerting on uh, Manchester City over the past year or two. Uh, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. And a reminder, if you don't have the OTB Sports app, then search OTB Sports in your app store and you'll get it there. Uh, text in here. Speaking of Manchester United opening days, Kenny, who got the blame for Beckham's goal from the halfway line in the dressing room after? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I wasn't holding my hand up on that occasion. There's plenty of hours over the other side of the pitch. I was just came. Oh, that's me. That's me at the top of the screen. That's me right back. Alan Kimball, 
uh, left back. You're not back. playing left back now. No, no, no we had a bit of a, we were both a bit of a fluffy barn and going there. You can have a look at me. So yeah, heading back to it. Okay, yeah. Trying to give me centre half a little bit of cover there, thinking yeah, is he going squeezing in? Yeah, good. Yeah, good, yeah. Good body position. Com compact defensive shape, but yeah, I think possibly Alan Kimball could could he got a bit closer there to Beckham. I mean, does anybody get any blame or what? And afterwards, Neil, Neil, Summer, Neil Summer got a bit of stick afterwards. So it, he yeah. was a little going back. Was not one of them goes back. Was you lose your bearings? You don't yeah, know where yeah. you are. Uh, it didn't look great, but um, that was a force of its type. There's a few after that, wasn't it? Rooney scored one. A few other people yeah. kind of jumped on it. But that was the, the audacity of that. You can't blame anybody. It's like that guy's pretty good. It turns out you didn't know Beckham was good at that stage, though. I was yeah, it's just on the up. You're right, but you're right. Yeah, it's uh, audacity and just kind of technical ability as well. I, mean, I couldn't. Keep, couldn't kick a ball over toward the eyes like through me laces. Like, I mean, that is, that is that is some technique. But that was pretty standard for him after that. But that was a bit of an iconic moment. Yeah. But yeah, it was a little bit of a little bit of a claim to fame for me that one. I was, you know, telling me about have a look at the top. No, don't look at Beckham. <laughs> Just have a look for the second you'll see me at the top of the screen. <laughs> Wasn't oh. much coverage there back then in the days. Jay, you had to match it today. You just had to take what you were given. Have you got to the point yet where you could actually rank the best goals scored against you? Oh yeah. Ah, yeah. oh, it was a long time. <laughs> but in I'm order. there. I'm there at every uh, any show, any producer who puts up the Premiership uh, greatest goals. goals. Ever, yeah. It was there. I was there during the week. They threw up a few, and I was. Oh, here we there go. There for all of them. Oh, I was there for all of them. Um, Decanio, Yaboa. Oh, Yaboa. Yaboa was, I think, the best goal I've ever. I was pleasure just to be alongside him as he kind of just ghosted past me, like you know, <laughs> and put it, put it in the top corner. There's a few others. There was a few others. Really? That, that one's just that, that's that's weak link. That's a bit of a weak link to oh, Beckham one. Oh, really? But I couldn't take a huge man. No, like, I, mean, I wouldn't get a portion. I own probably I own might say you oh, no, know, the, the ones that you were maybe could have been talking screaming at Alan Kimball to get tired you know, Sullivan he's got to shoot get back <laughs> yeah. get back in your goals your starting position's too high yeah. whatever yeah no but I've been there no uh, a lot of those uh, so you both uh, the best iconic yeah I thought in terms of uh, technique they're totally different uh, the kind of ball coming out it was a scissors kick wasn't it but the Abo went the heart volley like a little kind of threatened to shoot Kind of dragged it on the inside, then took it on the half volley on the up and the power. Power. The power went to get me, me fringe, me quiff. I just felt it like the breeze, just like, whoo, just <laughs> yeah, the ball went past it. <laughs> yeah, what can you do? We've got a laugh, Jerry. Oh, yeah, 20 years on, that's Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. Joe, Joe wasn't overly impressed at the time, Joe Kinnear, but you know, there you go. All right, time for the uh, pressure rankings. For me, it was self-imposed pressure. Because I under pressure. No. Yeah, they're under pressure. Everyone's under pressure. OTB AM's pressure rankings with Gillette. And the big pressure. Right, Owen, where are we starting? Uh, we'll start with number five in our countdown this morning. And I'm actually going with the Ireland, uh, Republic of Ireland uh, team on Saturday who were up against Germany, obviously in their Euro 2021 qualifier. Uh, like it's one thing. This is, it might make like a, a, a strange selection because I guess we associate pressure with you know winning and being in the melting pot of actually trying to get a positive result from a game. But I do think there is a different sort of pressure the way the Ireland women were set up on Saturday where they couldn't afford to get hammered too much. And yes, they get into a situation where they're 3-0 down. They're looking across at other results, I'm sure, and the build-up to this game, seeing Germany having beaten Montenegro 10-0, having beaten Ukraine 8-0, these are teams that Ireland are going toe-to-toe -to -toe with. They've got Ukraine next month. And to be in that position where you're 3-0 down, you're probably thinking to yourself, right, this is a, a massive, I guess, burden on our shoulders right now that we don't get into a situation where we're getting beaten 6 7 8 nil, because that automatically puts you in danger of qualifying. They didn't. They actually held on, despite you know the Germany boss screaming at her players, trying to get that fourth, that fifth goal, trying to absolutely crush Ireland. And they didn't actually get across the line. So... In a weird way, Ger, I'm going for the losers in a 3-0 result as one of the people who actually stood up well in the face of pressure this weekend. So that, that's at number five. At number four, you can take this away because I think there's always a bit of pressure on the Atlanta Falcons whenever they take even a small lead. Yeah, so if uh, you're a supporter of the Atlanta Falcons and you know all too well that a 28-3 lead in the Super Bowl is not good enough, uh, famously they have um, blown the most likely winning percentage chance ever in Super Bowl history and they did it again last night uh, at one stage the Dallas Cowboys who were playing at home in front of about three and a half thousand fans in their amazing stadium which holds about a hundred thousand uh, were 20 nil down at the end of the first quarter and had a two percent win chance and then ultimately end up winning the game the, there's um, this thing in American football where you can get the ball back after uh, you've just scored you have to perform an onside kick 
and it almost never works. It's it's basically set up to fail. Um, but somehow Dallas managed to um, kick the ball the requisite distance and run out. And none of the Atlanta Falcons fell on the ball. The Cowboys fell on the ball, got possession, went down the field, scored, and then uh, and won the game. And I, it, you, you got to look it up. It's on Twitter. It's absolutely ludicrous. I don't really know what rules prevented the Falcons from just jumping on the ball. Um, I think that maybe there was a misunderstanding on their part about some of the rules, which you know in professional sport really shouldn't happen, but it seems to have happened. Either way, irrespective of whether or not they uh, win it or not, a sensational game, which um, uh, had like 79 points scored, and uh, defence is not on top early in the season, it turns out, Kenny. This is, I think it's because they're all trying stuff and there's no fans in the stadium, I'm telling you. It's nothing, mm. to, do, nothing to do with technical proficiency at all. It's like, ah, this is just a training game. The blood is not up in many circumstances. So, uh, yeah, the um, the Atlanta Falcons, there's going to be a lot of sackings after that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, at number three this morning, we're going for Bryson DeChambeau, your new US Open champion, Bryson DeChambeau. And he's in the pressure rankings this week because he put the pressure on himself. Let's have a listen to his pre-tournament press conference. So everybody's interested in what your approach will be, yeah. given your length. I mean, I'm hitting as far as I possibly can up there. Even if it's in the rough, I can still get it to the front edge of the, or the middle of the greens with pitching wedges and nine irons. Mm -hmm. um, that's the, the beauty of, of my length and that advantage. Now, obviously, if it's into the wind and there's some, some of those situations going on, then it's going to be different. Um, you know, there's certain holes I might lay up on just because of the situation. But for the most part, I'm going to be trying to go after it as much as I possibly can. Do you have a lot of confidence because of the difficulty of this layout and your length <laughs> over the rest of the field? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even if I hit it in the rough, I still feel like I can make birdies out here. I still feel like I can run it up the middle of the green and make a 20-footer. Um, you know, give myself opportunity to still make birdie, whereas most people are laying back sort of a bunker hit in the rough even. It's not guaranteed if you lay up, you're going to end in the fairway. This is interesting because DeChambeau actually followed through on this exact technique. He actually did sort of ignore the importance of the fairways. He hit a total of 23 out of 56 possible fairways. That's 41.1% of a success rate. Since 1981, no US Open winner has hit fewer than 27 fairways. So he's four below that. In fairness to the guy, there's plenty of reasons to not like him, plenty of reasons to dislike him over the last little while especially. But he shows up to his press conference right before a tournament and says, I'm just going to hit the ball long. Doesn't matter if it lands in the rough and I'm going to go and win this tournament. And he actually is a man of his word and he does it. I, I, I think that he deserves a little bit of respect at least for that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, he's a, he's a comic book villain when it comes to golf and golf needs that. Um, I, uh, 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 an acquaintance of both of ours was in touch, Kenny, uh, to say it was Nathan. A load of them, quite a load of them. It was Nathan. Yeah. It was his mutual. Uh, he headed the ball to Tony Yaboa. You, you get the assist, Kenny. <laughs> you got the assist. No, he's he's, uh, he's stretching the truth there a little bit. He's stretching the truth. I know you're going to get the video. <laughs> I did, now you're going to get the video it. clip there. You, I did. I did head. It was defensive. Head, oh, I don't know whether it's trying to cushion the header to a team. But you might be right. You might be right. <laughs> I did hold my hand up. I did hold my hand. I wasn't. Fair enough. I wasn't the vicinity. And, and I thought of another goal, Michael Owen, by the way. His first ever Premier League goal. I was there as well. It was good, was it? On his coattails, yeah. Yeah. Should have cleaned them out. Didn't. So this kid will never like, score. His first like, game. Like Peter Reid against um, Diego Maradona in '86. Should have cleaned him out, but didn't. <laughs> should, have, um, should have got a few defensive tips off Diego Alcantara. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, the, uh, the Shambo, I think that's pretty depressing, actually. I actually am a fan of him, like, and uh, similar to Owen. I like his kind of confidence and stuff like that. But uh, the course planners, uh, course management, literally have to have a serious look at this in terms of... It's great that... I've seen him drive the ball in some tournaments, Owen. He's been really straight. I've seen him hit a lot of fairways in other tournaments, you know, 3, 350 or whatever, it's 360, and actually land it on the fairway. And that's pretty amazing, to be fair. That is real skill, like power and accuracy. But if, if he's saying, if he's looking at the cars thinking, you know, I'm just going to smash it, you know, if I end in the rough, it's not the end of the world, just kind of dig it out, you know, I can still make the green, then they've got to, you know, they've got to set up that course where if you do hit the, uh, the fairway, you ain't getting out. It's literally hitting a hope. So you've got to, you've got to marry it up. I think you've got to even it up. I think you've got to, you've got to um, reward the people, the accurate drivers of the ball, uh, uh, as opposed to, you can't encourage this attitude of just going to smash it as far as possible regardless of the setup and just like I'm confident I can just dig out a wedge and nine on every time onto the putt. That's that's not great golf. That's not great to watch. I like me golf, but I don't really want to tune in and watch that golf from, from the majority of the field. You can get pitching. Week put. in, week out. Yeah. Um, number two on our list today is uh, Saracens. I mean, we could also change this just to be 
Billy Vinopola, he is Ireland's kryptonite. It turns out we cannot beat this man. Whatever it is that he has against us, his size, his uh, sheer bloody mindedness, not, not, you know, it's got, got some issues with uh, some of the stuff that he's said and some of the things that he believes. But like, look, when it comes to rugby, um, he batters us single-handedly. Like, he is Gulliver and we are the Lilliputians. <laughs> it's true. Uh, like, I mean, I think you keep it at the Saracens at large, though, because you're missing your totemic out half. You know, you are massive underdogs. Is it nine-point underdogs? Yeah. And you're up against one of the best teams in the continent, supposedly, in their backyard. I know the lack of fans doesn't really make that uh, as much of an advantage as it should be. I don't know. I, I just think that it was Saracens being like, this is fantastic, all the stuff that's being written about us. This is brilliant that we've been totally written off. And uh, that first half certainly showed that, especially up front and the way they creamed Leinster in the scrum in the first half. The, the scrum non-stop. It, like, it felt like Ireland-England at Twickenham with Tom Court. And it felt like Ireland-England at uh, Twickenham this year. So there's like a long sequence of these heartbreaking defeats where you realise you're just not really at the races against this other team who are killing you. And so we'll get into that with Alan Quillen in uh, just a moment. And number one on your list, Owen? Number one is Killa Dangan. Who else could possibly be number one on our list this morning? What a day yesterday at Semple Stadium. Killa Dangan had never won the county title in tip before, and they were up against the might of Lockmore Castellani. They won it three times, Lockmore Castellani. Their most recent title came in 2013. So for anyone who didn't see this, we're in extra time after a cracking final. Things go nip and tuck throughout extra time. 20 minutes are played. It is still level. Then there is one minute of additional time played, and Lockmore Castellani get a 65. The clock ticks past 21, right as John McGrath strikes the ball and it sails over the bar. The very, very small crowd goes absolutely wild. It is heartbreak for Killadangan. But wait, there's more. The ref has allowed the puck out to be taken. It goes straight into the heart of the opposition defence. The ball is passed out to Brian McLaughlin. Can he equalise the question on all of our lips? Is this possibly going to penalties? There's two men between him and the goal posts. But forget the equaliser. He's only got the top corner of the net in his crosshairs. And bang, green flag, game over. The half of the crowd who didn't go wild 20 seconds previously are now going absolutely crazy. Kill it, Angan, under the greatest pressure possible. Hold their bottle and win their first ever county title. Full time, after extra time, Kill it, Angan, 128. Lockmore Castellani, 320. Not bad. Not bad. Incredible scenes. TG Cahar also picked the right game. Let's not forget this, live on uh, national television, they backed the right horse yesterday, so fair play to everybody in TG Uh That is the uh, Gillette Pressure Rankings for this week. OTB AM's Pressure Rankings with Gillette. We actually have the picture here. We've got the, we, there's a, some Zapruder film has emerged of the, uh, the Wimbledon-Leeds game. For what year is that? I couldn't tell you. That's you heading the ball there. That, that's you. That's the initial defensive. Head. Again, good defensive position. Again, good, good starting position, Jerry. I'll, you know, I'm going to... I back myself a little bit. Yeah, I just... Uh, Even like a fish. There's your boy kind of loitering with a tender 40 what, what yards away. I, I, what I'm just looking at the cushion, that's one we sent the midfield is just slightly misdirected. It's going to go to your bow here, is it? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, we don't have the video, but it, it bounces. I mean, your bow does get it and then dribble it round people over their heads and then smack it in, so... You know. But you're right. Stop it at source. I say that myself numerous times. Stop it at source. I didn't do it. You're right. Kenny, good stuff. Thanks for coming in today. Cheers, Jer. We've got rugby with Alan Quinlan next. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Brady and Belichick have been at the forefront of the credit in New England for the last 20 years. OTB's American Football Show. The Snap on OTB Sports Radio. So very much so in the deep end. He seems to have the correct temperament. I've never been totally won over by his actual talent, to be honest. Keep updated with American football on OTB. Tune into The Snap every Friday on OTB Sports Radio. Into sports. 20 yards out. Earth to shoot. Oh, oh, what a goal for Fabinho! And get into the all-new OTB Sports app. I think when he apologises to me, I probably will say hello to him, yeah. No. Videos, sports news, live scores, interviews. If Abregas is going to come up to me in the street and give me some of a mouth that he would have given me on a football pitch, what do we get a slap? Plus exclusive content on the OTB Podcast Network. The biggest names in sports. Ready when you are. Search OTB Sports on your app store and download it now.
As we learn to live with COVID-19, sport and fitness for your family are more important than ever. At the Sport Ireland campus in Blanchardstown, our facilities aren't just for elite athletes, but the community as well. So for European Week of Sport, we're hosting an open week from September 24th for families to try out a new sport and fitness experience together. So join dad for gymnastics or mum for rugby with over 20 different options. Check sportirelandcampus.ie for more. OTB AM With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. Nine minutes past nine this morning here on OTB AM. Time for us to turn our attention to rugby. Alan Quillen is with us. Alan, that was um, not a great weekend for Irish rugby. Uh, Ulster not at the races really at all. And Leinster absolutely pulverised in that opening 40 minutes to the point where it was essentially game over. <clears throat> Yeah, disappointing weekend, Ger. There's no doubt about it. And uh, it's not a huge shock that Saracens won on Saturday. I think Leinster were obviously favourites, given everything that has gone on with Saracens, the game being in Dublin. But um, the big fear uh, in any of these games is uh, the opposition start well away from home and, and their confidence-based side, Saracens. And you could see how together they were, how determined they were. Their sole focus was this match. They were fresh. Their emotion was through the roof. And uh, they just frustrated the life out of Leinster. And I think that's probably where Leinster um, failed. Uh, the set piece was poor and they allowed the opposition to really unsettle them. A couple of times in the in the previous weeks, and particularly in the Munster games, Munster frustrated them a fair bit at the breakdown and, and stopped their flow. And that's what you do against Leinster. If I was going out analysing how do you beat Leinster, you, you stop them, you frustrate them, you get in amongst them. And they look like a team that probably have forgotten what that's like because of maybe the brilliant run they've been on and, and they're, they're excellent. So I, I, I don't think it was a case of Leinster switched off and they, they thought this was going to be easy. I just think that maybe just a couple of percent they were off in that first half and whereas Saracens were just through the roof with their emotion and their aggression and intensity and, and uh, they threw everything at us. And then... You know, I think Leo Cullen talked about the, his frustration of Saracens players going down, the stop-start nature of the game, um, and that's the way they, that's what they do to the opposition. They really frustrate them. And Lens were obviously way better in the second half, but just that that scoreline was just too hard to claw. They're too good a side to 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 claw them back from that much of a lead, even though Leinster, in fairness to them. And that, that's what will frustrate him more because what we saw in the second half was probably the true true Lancer. They were just out of the blocks too too late and uh, the power and the physicality of Saracens really unsettled them in that first half. The power of the, the front five in particular from Saracens and in the scrum. So the scrum was a complete disaster. The same way, like, I don't know if you remember specifically, Irish rugby went into this long, dark period of uh, self-analysis after Tom Cork comes on and gets shifted onto the wrong side of the scrum all those years ago in, in Twickenham that was like this massive turning point where there was a huge investment made in trying to find new props so that we would never be humiliated like that again in the scrum and here we are and we just don't have the strength and depth in the scrum once Tyg Furlong is out Andrew Porter is in and if Andrew Porter is struggling you're looking at the bench and it's Michael Benton. That's not good enough to win a, a Heineken Champions Cup quarter-final. No, and, they, and they've been unlucky in that front with Ty Furlong out injured. It's it's a huge loss to him. I don't think it was an individual who was being completely pulverised. If you go back to the Tom Cork one as a tight head, and any team who wants to be successful needs a good tight head. That's your, the anchor of your scrum. Um but I think it was a collective thing. The Leinster front row were a little bit high. Um, their, their body position wasn't good. And obviously they were coming up against a side, a front row that, that's top-class international front row, world-class. You know, Jamie George is, is the starting a pro, a hooker for England. Vunapolo is for, you know, and both starting for the Lions, uh, George and, and Vunapolo in the last tour. Vincent Koch won a World Cup with South Africa. Um so they're coming up against probably some of the best you'll meet in, in at, at that level. But I just think they were much too high. Sean Cronin came in for Ronan Kelleher. Um, and they just seemed to be very disjointed. Even looking at Keane Healy's body position, he was twisting and turning a lot. Um, Andrew Porter went down his knee a couple of times, was penalised for that. 
I'm not sure some of those penalties were definite penalties. I'd have issues with 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 the decisions were made made by the referee and, and a couple of them. Um, but it's the perception of the referee, and if you get a couple of dominant ones, there's a natural inclination to go and give more. Um, so one or two of them were harsh, but it doesn't take away from the fact that there was utter dominance there. Uh, James Ryan and um, you know Toner. he's not long back from injury, and Toner um, they're not these big 120. Even though Devin Toner is very very tall and and heavy, he's 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 not a light. Uh, you know, he's not lacking for kilos. Um, their power and Atoja in the second row and just a collective unit, I think um, Robin McBride, the pressure comes on him. Why didn't your scrum work? That's what Leo Cullen will want to know and why was it like this? A um, couple of reasons. The opposition, as I said, were very, very good and Lens are very, very disjointed and maybe not tested in that uh, manner in a long, long time and that, that had a fa- played a, po- a factor in it as well. When you pinpoint body position there, Alan, who's that down to when you're looking at the front row? Is it the coaching it's, players themselves? No, it's 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 probably just um, subtle little changes of, of their bodies. And it, look, it's easy for someone to look back and, and pause it and see the body position are in a different way. Um, they're twisted, they're too high, they're, they're not all in, in sync with each other. It's It's not a coaching thing. It's it's pressure as well. You know, it's pressure from the opposition. I looked at, I paused it a good few times and Vincent Cox's body position was as good as you'll get for a tight head. Um, I know some tight heads bore in a little bit and he, you could argue that there was a little bit of a, a twist inwards, but his body position was just like 90 degree angle. The back was dead straight. Um, the hammers and glutes all loaded. Great position, legs right up and under him and um, he's a very good scrummager but he's a very good technical scrummager you know you can have the biggest heaviest guy in the world in there as a tight head like Vincent Cock isn't a huge man um, he's not this monster size but technically he's very very good and when you have a tight head who can get that little nudge that little bit of dominance and uh, as I said George and Bruno Polo were, were putting massive pressure on as well so they sense a bit of vulnerability. Like there's a lots of times in matches, teams conserve their energy because they, you can't target every single scrum to to go 110. percent There's certain areas of the field that you will just go for it. Um, there's some that you just, you know, you'll 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 let the opposition. You're not letting them win it without pressure, but you're not putting, you're not wasting energy. Saracens went for every single scrum the other day. And that tempo increased because of the vulnerability that was there. And sometimes it just all goes wrong. A few, if if Leinster forwards are going out this morning trying to get it right, there'd be a massive focus and onus on being much tighter as a group, making sure the back row are scrummaging as well. Um, Caelan Doris and, and and Will Connors a few times. Because of the threat of Vunapolo as well, they're keeping their head up to try and uh, see is he going to, pick and go off the side of the scrum so I just don't think I think as an eight um, collectively their their scrummaging was it let themselves they let themselves down there So here's a team that hasn't lost a game since last year's European final and now this year goes the whole way unbeaten through the league and uh, Again, and the pool stage is a Europe as well. Yeah, and it, look, you don't want to um, you don't want to overreact in the immediate aftermath of a defeat, but maybe if there's a yellow card in the second half for the clash of heads on Sexton, maybe that gets them back into the game. But you're you're kind of hoping that it's going to be a refereeing decision ultimately that changes the course of the match from a Leinster perspective, and essentially they're just in chase mode at that point, so they're kind of throwing caution to the wind. Like the game is lost in the first half, and that's when they're called to do their job, and that's when, you know, they've been lining up the Saracens team for a long, long time, and it's a much weakened Saracens team. We kept getting told how weakened this team was. Their their out half is gone because it looked like he'd self sabotaged the the previous week for no particular reason in a meaningless game. Like, it's hard also to understate how much of a crisis this feels like, where our best team, with all of the playing resources and all of the resources that they have of young players coming through are actually quite far off the elite of European rugby at the moment. 
I, I don't think they are, Ger. I think um, Saracens were very shrewd in the way they played the game, and they're quite a cynical side. And some sometimes, you know, cynicism can be a big advantage. Um, we and, and Munster were probably criticised for that at times about, you know, entry points into breakdowns, being offside, whatever you like, slowing the game down, stopping the opposition. Saracens are, are and, I, and I applaud them for that. I'm, that's not a criticism. I think they're a nuisance to play against. You can't, they give you no chance to to kind of settle and, and relax in the game and kind of do your stuff because there's constant pressure all the time. But Leinster have to look at themselves here. I don't think the gap is... I think if Leinster plays Saracens next Saturday, it'll it'll still be a tight game. But I think Leinster will not come out as slow like they did. Their discipline will be so much better. Um, they give away soft penalties. And I think their discipline the last few weeks, um, even in their dominance and winning matches, has been borderline because they really, really push that offside line um, and again, that can work in their advantage and can be a real positive. But I think they just needed to take a step back. They gave away a few soft penalties aside from the scrum ones, um, which Saracens love. They're a, I said this on Friday. They're a 3, 6, 9, 12 team who just tap the penalties over and they receive the kickoff and they get back down the field with a box kick and it's more pressure, hoping for a knock-on, hoping for another penalty put it in the corner, get their mall rumbling. It's 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 very hard to play against that when they're very powerful and they hold on to the ball well. Um, uh, the trouble is that we've seen the Ireland team get beaten by yes. an England team doing this. And we actually saw this same performance from Leinster in last season's Champions Cup final. Like Maybe the maybe the Saracens team was significantly better then than this team and Leinster were supposed to be better than the Leinster team. So that that's why it does feel like there is still that gap. There's a there's a psychological issue with this now, Ger. You go back to the World Cup warm up uh, before they went to the World Cup. England sm- sm- hammered Ireland. Um, then we had the disappointment at the World Cup. Then you have this um, the the Six Nations game um, and and the previous Six Nations game in in January 2019, which was the start of all this. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a psychological effect now and. Uh, to change that, you've got to win a game. Ireland have to beat England or, or one of the provinces have to beat Saracens because the vast majority of them are, uh, the, the English players are Saracens players. And uh, look, there's there's a there's a group of players there still within that Saracens um, t- team and squad who are, are mainly English players who have that physicality and power. We don't have it. We have some players who are close to it and can uh, provide great acceleration and power to, to in the contact areas but the we, we you don't have the same power the the Vuna Polar brothers when they play for England or Saracens make a huge difference the tackles that they made on Saturday the way they chopped Leinster down and just stopped them getting any sort of go forward momentum in that first half and even at times when Leinster were very good in the second half and they had Saracens under massive pressure they just came up with big tackles who it just took away that little bit of impetus and um, most teams would have buckled with that pressure that Leinster were putting them on in the second half. But you just got to send when it went to 22-17, you thought, you know, Leinster are going to do the job here um, and, and they're going to win this game and turn it around. But Len- Saracen showed with experience and with calmness and with that power that, that um, they, they could uh, control that and, and absorb that. So they do have a little bit more power. And historically, English teams are always... a bigger than us and they have that more power they have more players to put, choose from so I think there is a case of and this is a challenge for Andy Farrell going forward and it will be a challenge for Leo Cullen again when you play Saracens is finding a bit of variety executing better and not giving them what they want which is openly said by Mark McCall is they want penalties they want to slow the game down they want a box kick um, their kick chase is very good um, we criticised Monsters in the se- in the semi final a few weeks ago, but Wigglesworth box box kicks yes or, or Saturday were top class, and sometimes it's just very hard to deal with that. Um, so there has to be a bit more variety, but there also has to be a better continuity in attack and holding on to the ball and 
Um, because they have the ability, they, uh, these players have the ability, a Toja and the Funapolos, of even after six, seven, eight, ten phases of coming up with a big turnover or a massive tackle that just stops the whole flow. So it's difficult and it, there's no quick fix to this. Um, but you know, I think uh, you get into a little bit of a rot on a mental side of this, um, and it can affect them, and you know. I don't think it was a huge mental thing on Saturday. I just think Leinster, for some reason, and maybe if it's down to a little bit a lower intensity in the Pro 14 that they've experienced in the last few weeks, that maybe they weren't battled hardened as much as they needed to be. You could argue that Saracens kind of mixed and matched for the last couple of weeks and didn't play their top players the week before. So there is an argument, there's counter argument. There is, because like, Saracens are playing in a league where it doesn't matter. Those, none of those matches actually matter yeah, to them. Yeah, like I, I know yeah. we were talking about this a little bit earlier on, about the, the depth of the Premiership is obviously significantly greater than the depth in the Pro 14, but you can also make the case that they were playing glorified friendlies in the build-up to this, and all of a sudden they come out against, yeah. you know. Uh, and, Leinster did, and Leinster didn't cope with that um, emotion, because I, I think it is to myself as a player, and... If if I told you, Ger, in a mo- one month's time you have a kind of backs to the wall game that um, if you lose it, you're kind of gone off the, the 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 front the back pages. You're you're gone to the championship. You're dropping down a league, but you win this one game and you can give the two fingers to everybody and you can shut up all the critics and you can really galvanise um, and take something massive out of really negative season for, for Saracens and it's one off, everyone thinks you're not going to lose and you start preparing mentally for that, you you can really, really get your focus into and it doesn't matter if you don't play a game to that match, it's like you're going out throwing the kitchen sink and you're you know, coaches often say to players particularly in underage teams, just bust your gut for 50, 60 minutes and we'll bring pe- we got to bring players on and sometimes it's a mental thing and, and it is a big intrigue of contact sport is is that emotional pitch that you turn up with like that's not to say that Leinster didn't turn up with a high emotion but I think things were happening so well for them for so long that maybe there's an expectation that it will happen again and well we know Saracens are going to come at us and we know they're going to be physical but we're going to be ready for that but were they really ready for that start and no do, crowd there as well, do we need, and it diluted a little bit. Do we need our teams to be more cynical, more streetwise, a bit more like your Munster team? Um, it helps sometimes, but it also you also get punished. I know that from my experience, giving away a penalty or something crucial. But I just felt Leinster a little bit were bullied in that first half, and I I always hate to see that for any any team. Um, you know, I've all, always told a young age set the tone early if you can. Uh, be physical, be aggressive earlier, and, and look, Leinster would have had that um, that that vibe gone out there. I'm sure they were pumped up, ready to go, but they just made critical errors then with that pressure. So not being able to cope with that kind of pressure um, and not having that same kind of pressure again against a very good side. We're, we're talking a lot about you know the what ifs here, but Saracens were superb and they played and and controlled the tempo of that game very well. So Leinster have got to figure out that. Ireland have got to figure out that better. And, you know, that will be the lingering frustration here because, like I said, Leinster were very, very dominant in that second half. And, and when it went back to five points, you think they're going to win it now. Um, and and, and that, that will linger with them for a bit what, as to why that happens and why they started so poorly in that, that, at the start of the game. And no one has any yeah. answers. Go on, go yeah. on. Like, but like, how, how do you well, manage the, the, the answers, the answers, Ger, is the, the bench is an issue. Their set piece is an issue. Um, their, their overall depth isn't maybe as good as we think it is. So there is issues there. There's no doubt. Lens are not this formidable side that um, are unbeatable. I said this for the last couple of weeks. Munster showed frailties. Leinster, Ulster did it a, a little bit in the first half they did yeah it was too easy for them they didn't try any point you look at JJ Henry and he kicks the two penalties there's a mall at the end of the game there's, there's, there's a couple of opportunities in that game that Munster could have met much tighter Leinster deserved to win that semi-final but you analyse that game and Martin McCall would have seen that 
they're lacking a bit of a hard edge that they maybe they would have had, I think, before. There's a little bit of hardness gone out of, off that team at the moment, and they've got to find that again. So there, there's, the answers here are the set piece, the physicality, and and some of the decision-making and their discipline was poor. So they've got to get better at that. Just because you go on a massive winning run doesn't mean you can't improve anymore. They do have to get better, and they've got to learn from this quickly because, you know, Joe, Joe Malai asked me yesterday in Virgin about, well, had they not learned from 2019? Well, maybe not. Uh, maybe they expected it to happen, and maybe the worst thing that happened was Saracens lost all these players, and maybe some part of their mind thinks, well, they're not going to be as good as they were in 2019, and we're on this brilliant run. So it is a kind of a wake-up call again. And no matter what age you are as a player, whether you're 21 or 31, you learn experiences, hard experiences along the way. And, and sometimes you're just a couple of percent off. And Leinster mentally were off at the start of that game. And I guarantee you, you know, and I go back to that game in 09 when, when Leinster beat us, we, we were very dominant against Leinster in two games earlier that season. And everyone was saying, we're going to win this game in Croke Park. And we... would I spoke about it all week. I've said this many times about their reaction, what they're going to throw at us. And sometimes it's just nothing you can do. The bounce of the ball, the start of the game that, that time in 09. And that's what kind of happened with, with Saris and Saturday. So the worrying part is there's a bit of a trend about the physicality and the power, as you say, with the English games. Yeah, uh, just on Ulster then yesterday, Alan, if you're saying that Leinster got a bit of a wake-up call on Saturday, were Ulster ever in a mind space yesterday, in your opinion, where they felt they could actually win that game? Um, I don't think so. They didn't show it anyway. Um, could see him missing Tom O'Toole being out at the start, unsettled them. Uh, Will Addison's a loss to that team. Um, so I think, you know, the injuries, Billy Burns gone off. Um the 6-2 split, uh, not being able to bring Madigan on and moving Michael Lowry up and a lot of chopping and changing. But ultimately, and, and doing the commentary or doing sitting in studio for the game, I just felt that, you know, the game was at 8-3 and you think, Jesus, they've had a couple of opportunities here and they haven't taken them and they made some line breaks and just very, very sloppy. And, and I, I don't even think Toulouse were at their best. Toulouse were in third maybe fourth a few times and back down to third again. And Leinster just also just weren't good enough and lacked that punch. They tried hard for sure, but I think there was a few opportunities there that they didn't take yesterday. And some of the penalty, you know, there was one penalty there just, um, just after half time where they got turned over close to the, to the Toulouse line and, and Sean Reedy carries the ball. And it was, it was after about two or three phases, and I just thought that kind of sums it up. Very close to the Toulouse line, great chance of building some pressure and getting a try, and they got turned over too easily. So uh, did a lot of good things at different stages, but ultimately they were totally outclassed and, and um, never really in bar for a 15, 20 minute period when it was 8-3. They had a couple of opportunities. And if they'd gone in at halftime, they conceded a try just before halftime, if they'd gone in at half time um, on that score line, who knows? But <clears throat> Toulouse came out firing in the second half and uh, and blew them away. Pretty chastening well, weekend, all told. There's not much we can do with the absence of power, is there? Or like, do we just start putting our uh, 12 and 14 year olds on a, a specific beef and milk diet, Alan, <laughs> and doing weights? No, I don't think so. I think yeah, it is a concern when you play against, like, you know, South Africa traditionally have always been the biggest side. And, uh, you know, we found plenty of ways to beat them in on, on a number of occasions um, in the last 10 years. So you just got to be a little bit different. And I think maybe we're, we're you know, we need to have uh, we evolve a little bit more in the way we play. We've plenty of talented players, but and ideally you'd love to have... Um, not necessarily backs, because uh, but you know a few big bruisers in the forwards and uh, and you know traditional uh, backies both or Etzebet type player, but you've just got to deal with what you have to deal with. I think Ryan Baird is a fantastic player. He showed incredible energy. Ronan Keller when they come off the bench, 
um, at the weekend were, were very, very powerful. So it's not all about totally getting size. It's just been about better execution and having a little bit more, um, having some change in the way we play. Yeah. I think that will help. All right, Alan, good stuff. Thanks for joining us. Cheers, lads. Alan Quinlan um, giving us some pause for thought this morning, Owen, about uh, what the future of Irish rugby looks like. Yes, I guess a fairly worrying development what's happened over the course of the weekend where I think we've still clung to this notion that maybe 2019 was an aberration and uh, 2020 came along and that Wales game in the Six Nations possibly said, well, yeah, 2019 was just a once-off, but then the England game happened uh, right before lockdown, didn't have the opportunity to right those wrongs against France and Italy, didn't have the opportunity to see really where Ireland were at uh, I think maybe we just get sucked into the Pro 14 a little bit. It was all the like the only thing we've had before the weekend was Pro 14 for a month, and we're seeing Leinster dominate, and we're comparing them to the Dubs, and like are they the best Irish sports team ever? All that sort of thing, and it's impossible for that narrative to not change. Just been completely humbled by that first half that Saracens played on Saturday. Yeah, and look, it's going to be very interesting to see how they bounce back from this because. Uh, you know, the sun having no alternative, Sean, another thing new, there is a new season coming along pretty quickly, it turns out, and the internationals are uh, nearly upon us. Obviously, we've got to wait and watch what happens in the European Cup over the next couple of weeks, but after that, then there are some, there is still last season's Six Nations, and then there are these uh, November internationals to look forward to, and an opportunity to see what a, an Ireland team looks like with Ryan Baird in the second row. And like, do we just go there now and say, right, you're our second row for the next decade? You're going to have to learn how to deal with Maro Toje again and again and again. So next time you do that and you learn and you lose that game, but the time after that you win. Maybe. Like, he definitely was a bit of a wrecking ball on Saturday as far as wrecking balls in a Leinster shirt went. And that is something that Ireland have been lacking for a long, long time, as Alan has been pointing out there. A reminder uh, that uh, I, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Now, let's move on because the uh, Ireland women's team were beaten 3 0 on Saturday afternoon by Germany. Um, in many respects, there was just a 10 minute period which did for them, but ultimately, the result is not critical in terms of their uh, ability to qualify for the actual tournament itself. Ruth Fahey is with us to give us some analysis. Um, Ruth, you know, talking to people who know a bit about this, they were very concerned in the build-up to the game that this German team are probably the best team in international football at the moment. So um, any, any range of outcomes was possible. Where does 3-0 sit in terms of the damage that it does to the team, either psychologically or in terms of their ability to qualify? Um, in terms of psychologically, I don't think it will damage them too negatively at all, to be honest. Um, coming into the game, there's a lot of talk about predictive scorelines and things like that. Had said three or less would be good, and watching the first 10 or 20 minutes of the game open up, I definitely felt that even more so, uh, especially after eight minutes when they got that first goal. And Germany were actually better than I thought they would be. Uh, there was a lot of talk about them being number two, but actually probably being the number one at the moment. Um, I nearly kind of doubted that, but just watching them play, they they seem to have upped it. Obviously, their technical ability has always been first class, but in terms of power, pace, speed, like the speed at which they play now, it's very much ticky-tacky football. They're opening up Ireland a lot easier than anticipated in the first uh, quarter of the match or so. So, But in saying all that, it was 3-0 at halftime. Ireland went back in and regrouped and came out and had fixed those problems. They were, they were I suppose less penetrating in the final third. Uh, they tightened the lines a little bit. Um, and then ultimately, they didn't concede in the second half. So psychologically, I actually think Vera Power would be quite pleased with that first half. In terms of qualification, doesn't set them back too much at all. In fact, conceding three goals against Germany, who put in 10 past Montenegro, who put in 16 on aggregate against Ukraine, um, it won't put them back too much at all. And all eyes are firmly upon 23rd of October when they take on Ukraine. It seems, Ruth, they almost have a, a template if they were to come up against a team uh, in the top tier but not quite on Germany's level where they might actually be able to squeak a result where it possibly wasn't going to happen on Saturday but the way they play out of the back with their back to the wall before that is possibly a way that they can actually get a, a draw or a win and get, get that first big upset that perhaps they need for the next step in this progression. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. I think watching the game... The gap is clear. You're looking at two teams that are at a different level, but Pau had such a clear game plan. And I think I saw one headline, defeated but not disgraced. And I think that's really apt 
they didn't panic. They went down early, like I said, within 10 minutes. But the 40, 41st minute, they were 3-0 down. But they didn't panic. They didn't capitulate whatsoever. Um, I don't think they're anywhere close to sort of like nicking a draw or nicking points away from a top seed side like Germany. But what it did show is that they're capable of not being disgraced like Ukraine and Montenegro were. Ultimately, the goal is to get to a major qualifying tournament. And if they do, they're obviously going to face a team like Germany, the Dutch, you know, Sweden, Norway, these big sides. There'd be a lot less of a fear factor than there was initially. Going into that game was pretty much the unknown. Like Vera had come in 2019, you, Ukraine, Montenegro, Greece, you know, their, their tests, Greece, Ukraine, more at Ireland's level. But that was the first big, big one um, of a big team. And there won't be a fear now when Germany come back and play around Tallis Stadium in December. Um, hopefully the group and the qualification will be wrapped up by then. But it's it's that first huge test. And I think they came through very capably. The, the question is, what, what would you do to, uh, I guess, give us a, a puncher's chance in that sort of scenario, Ruth? Are, are, were we operating uh, off Ireland's very best on, on Saturday? Because I, I guess the, the aim was to get Rihanna Jarrett into good positions where she might be able to speed past a, a German defender. The problem was she had four German defenders around her at every opportunity. Yeah, you have to remember how difficult it is to play when you don't have the ball for nearly 90 minutes mm. of the game. Um, it's I, I heard Anya Gorman speak afterwards, and we're talking about a player who's got over 100 caps. She's so much experience playing against huge teams, and she said it was probably one of the most difficult matches she's ever played, one of the most difficult teams she's ever played against. Um, and that goes to show just how, how good Germany are, like I said, even better than I had expected. You're chasing the game. You're not just you're not just chasing the game. You're, you're actually working at nearly your max percent for, for almost 90 minutes. So when you do get the ball, I thought in the first half, they actually did okay. I thought Leanne Kiernan, she created a corner kind of out of nothing. Uh, she showed she, she, that she had the pace against the German fullback. They got a second corner and from both those corners, there were kind of semi-chances. Um, in terms of Brianna Jarrett's performance, talk about a thankless job. She was, she did her best. She she, she couldn't manage hold the hold of the play. I think when she did get the ball, she was dispossessed. She, once or twice she managed to lay off the ball, but it was just, it's an impossible job. Um, you could see what Vera Pau had planned. She was trying to utilise the channels, use the pace of Kieran and McCabe and get Jared to hold it up. It didn't quite come to fruition, but again, when you meet Germany again, that's kind of the next stage that you bring into your progress. Today was, or sorry, Saturday was about just keeping the scoreline down, ultimately, being realistic, as, as Pau always says. Um, operating up front then, it didn't quite come off for Ireland, but... Like I said, the next time they play Germany would be a little bit better. Thought they did okay in the centre. Little John Conley and O'Sullivan. I think when you see a match where Denise O'Sullivan doesn't quite get on the ball, doesn't quite get those little moments where she usually does, even against a big team where, she's, where Ireland have usually had very little possession, Denise O'Sullivan has managed to kind of stand out at moments. It didn't quite happen on Saturday. And again, that just shows how good Germany actually were. And I thought Vera Power was really intelligent, made a smart move to bring Diane Caldwell back a right full. I hadn't anticipated that Nee Fahey would go in back beside Quinn. Like Fahey obviously plays there with Liverpool as a centre half. I thought they did relatively well. And Anya Gorman, the only player in the Women's National League to start, um, stood strong and, and definitely represented the domestic league really well. So I think Vera Pau actually nailed it, to be honest. Uh, I was really proud of the players at full time. Um, 3-0 is a very respectable scoreline. People can say there's, there's, that's not good enough, but there's no shame in going out against a side ranked number two who look like number one in the world, coming off 3-0 away from home after not being together for how many months. There's absolutely no shame in that scoreline and very respectful. And it all goes really positively into Ukraine. And, and ultimately, that's what it's all about. It's about getting second place. That was the, that was, that was the plan from the very start. Vera Pau hasn't moved from that plan. She's been completely consistent in what she's been saying. Um, and which is really refreshing. I thought her post-match interview was excellent. And um, I think they definitely have everything lined up perfectly for Ukraine at the end of October. October 23rd, that massive clash with Ukraine. That's an away game for us. Ruth, thanks for joining us this morning. Cheers for the analysis. Thanks, thanks. guys. Have a good one. It's uh, Ruth Fahey giving us uh, her thoughts on a 3-0 or three win for Germany against Ireland on Saturday afternoon. A reminder, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. And, of course, you should be listening to us on the OTB Sports app. That's the best place to get us these days. You can get us by searching OTB Sports in your app store. And uh, if you want to get in touch with us right now, the easiest way to do that is by WhatsApp. That's 87 180 It's uh, 43 and a half minutes past nine this morning. We are um, going to speak with Sam Bennett, Ireland's newest Tour de France hero, in just a moment. 
But first, I've got to play you this. It's from WLRFM, the uh, local radio station down in Waterford. Their sports presenter, Nigel Kelly, was embedded at the Bennett House yesterday. Uh, a big day, and uh, once the intermediate sprint gave everybody a little bit of confidence and a little bit of calm, then he did catch up with the Irish superstar's mother, Helen, and captured the final moments of the dramatic stage. He lost the wind. Oh, he's out the wind. He just looks out of position for the television. Your son has won the green jersey. And he won it on the Champs Elysee, winning the sprint finish. What's that like? Surreal. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, uh, my voice is gone. <laughs> I'm pure and utter excited, yeah. static, and just so happy and so proud. So proud, you know, what can I say? I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, you know, this is Sam. Yeah. This is Sam up there. I can't believe it. And he's so well deserved to get where he is today. You know, I'm so, so happy for him. Has and it properly just, sunk in? No, actually, not at all. I think tonight, when everything kind of calms down a little bit, we'll probably just uh, put it on and watch it like I'm watching it for the yeah. first time yeah. and still cry and still scream and shout and just, oh my God, it's just... I, don't, I, I think we'll wake up tomorrow morning and think and say to ourselves, did that just happen? <laughs> you know, and we just spoke with Sam there. He was in the back of a car and he's just turning the camera to the Eiffel Tower and Tara is in the back of the car with him and we're just chatting and we're just saying, can we believe this? You know, this is the ultimate. I actually can relax now for the races from now yeah. on in. I think I can just sit and look and say, oh, great. You know, enjoy the rest. Because up to now, oh my God, I was shattered, I was shattered. You know, I literally had lost my voice. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it's amazing, you know, and hopefully it'll get all the young kids back out on bikes again and, yeah. you know, and, and, and get the excitement of it going again. It'll be super, you know, and especially with the COVID and how bikes had become, had re a resurgence of cycling, that this again now will give it another boost up, another level. So that footage from WLR, Sam Bennett, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. Not too bad. Yourself? Have you watched that numerous times? Uh, I haven't. Uh, I haven't seen it yet. No. Uh, the level of excitement in your front room and your uh, mum's front room was absolutely off the charts. In the middle of it, though, there's oh no, he's lost the wheel. Typical Irish pessimism. It's not going to happen. And then all of a sudden, it does, and it's just an eruption of joy. What were you feeling? Uh, when I when I rewatched it, or in the race? In the race, actually. Do you remember? Uh yeah. Well, yeah. The last before, I, I felt that there was a bit of a, a uh, the headwind was a bit too strong. So when my teammates had me coming into the the corner and the last corner and we were one two, I thought it, we were a bit too early. And uh, I was aware of uh, the other team there with two other riders, so I let them slot in, and for them to kick first and to to take a, a run at the the other sprinters' leadouts man's wheel and. Uh, and then take a line, uh, run for the line um, uh, very late. So uh, yeah, it was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was a bit of a, uh, yeah, improvising. That's class, I didn't realize it. So the, in the middle of the race, the tactics are kind of off the charts. And when, when do you realize that it's actually worked? Is it literally when you're crossing the line? Yeah, like even 50 meters to go, um, you know, you kind of hit your peak speed and uh, you're, you're just trying to hang on then. And um, yeah, I was just afraid that that somebody was going to come past me. And uh, yeah, when I got to like, I think 10 meters before the line, then I knew I had it. And yeah, I couldn't believe it. Uh, it's It was an incredible sensation. Um, it's, it's something that I never thought I'd be able to do because it's, it's often regarded as uh, the, the Sprinters World Championship um, and it's even hard to get there because it's at the end of the Tour de France. So yeah, it was just, it was, it was an amazing feeling. 
There's a great photograph in one of the papers today of you just around the corner and you're on your own, but you're looking up at the big screen, watching the replay of the, the race finish. And we all got to see the interview that you did after your first stage win uh, a couple of weeks ago, it feels like now. And the bit there where you were kind of uncertain that you'd actually won, there was, you kind of had to have it confirmed to you a, a couple of different times as well. So it's just been this mad roller coaster for you for the last couple of weeks. Yeah, um, the first one was really emotional just because all the hard work and the years that were put in um, and it was just such a slow progression to get here um, and yeah, it was always a battle um, and then yeah, just I, I just couldn't believe it happened and then yeah, the, the, the picture where I'm looking at the big screen, it was like, <laughs> did this just happen? Um, and I was watching it, watching it again on the big screen and taking it in, and uh, yeah, it was it was awesome. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but to be honest, uh, I just want to thank my whole team. Um, couldn't have done it without them. Throughout the whole race, they looked after me, got me through the mountains, got me within the time cuts each day. Um, and yeah, just it was a, it was a real team effort as well. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a great few weeks. The day that you got green, it seemed was less emotional than the day you won the the actual first stage for the first time in the Tour de France. Is that is that true, or were you just they didn't capture that emotion as well as the post race interview and in the immediate aftermath of the victory? Well, you see, when you, when I got the green, it was like yeah, like I had. It, I had it then, but it was something that I was only holding for a few stages, and I didn't really think I had physical capacity to to carry it all the way through. Um, but then it wasn't until I actually had the jersey that it was like, oh, maybe this is a a dream that I I, I didn't realize I had um, until I I put on that jersey, and then once I got a taste for it, I was like, oh, actually. I want this jersey, <laughs> and uh, so I fought really, really hard for it, and uh, it was a tight competition. Um, but uh, yeah, the emotion didn't come out for that because it was a, it was a slow burner because you're trying to defend it, you're racing the whole time through it. I, I lost at one stage, got it back. Um, so so that was more kind of on the road, and then just just wearing it coming onto the Champs Elysees when we entered for the the, the first lap. I got goosebumps, you know, um, to, to be a sprinter um, wearing the green jersey coming into the final sprint and the Tour de France is something amazing. And then and then when I got the intermediate points, um, I think it was three laps to go and I knew I had the green jersey. Uh, that was a special moment, but it was within the race, so nobody really got to see that side of it and then i had to switch my focus again and go for the for, for the for the sprint so yeah the green jersey was maybe something i didn't get to celebrate until after the race that that's very interesting sam because uh, like it's one of the most famous theaters in sport the final day of the tour de france and i wondered if as a cyclist it just doesn't matter as much you're just focused on the task at hand but from the sound of things the idea of being on the champs elysees how famous this sporting piece of theatre you're right in the middle of that does really strike home with you as you mentioned those goosebumps there yeah like um and normally there's more crowds so you go in you just like the last time i did that i just remember the banging on the barriers and the roars and you can't even hear each other um it was a little bit more tame this year but it was still uh you get all these waves of emotions and um and it's often regarded as the, the sprinters world championship um yeah. And it's the one that every sprinter dreams of winning. Um, and it's something that I've watched years growing up, you know, like they, they had the camera angle at the side, uh, running alongside the peloton. So as a kid, I often watched that and replayed it and saw some of my heroes win that way. Um, and, you know, like I, I, I have won in other Grand Tours, so I was, I was, I was gradually getting confidence in that okay, maybe one day I could win a stage in the Tour de France, but I never thought that I could get that the Champs-Élysées, you know, that that was that was one really high up on the bucket list, and but I, I never thought I could get that, and that's a dream come true. And then, actually, to do it in the green jersey, that's just the icing on the cake. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous. 
yeah, uh, it, I yeah, I don't know. It's, it's yeah, it, it's it's an amazing sensation, and I, I just can't believe I got the opportunity to in my career to do this. <laughs> You mentioned coming down to Champs Elysees before, uh, like that would have been for Lantern Rouge, I presume, or, or am I forgetting a, a, another year the, yeah. in between? Then it, it, it's quite quite a turnaround, isn't it? It's like I, I, I mean, it's just one thing watching it as a kid and picturing yourself there. Is it almost harder to imagine as Lantern Rouge going down the home stretch of the Champs Elysees actually at the other end of the pack entirely? Yeah, I think um, it probably makes the win all the sweeter. Um, but the, the GC isn't something that I would ever, ever look at. Um, sure. I don't even know where I finished this year, to be honest. Actually, I really don't know my, my where I was in GC. Um, it's so like you kind of look at sprinters more as stage hunters, uh, if that makes sense. But, um, um, yeah, sorry, I'm off the losing train. Um, does it make but, it even uh, sweeter? Yeah, sorry. Um, but yeah, like the last time, yeah, I had a bad accident on the first stage and I just wanted to finish the Tour de France. So fighting that hard and finishing at that time and having such a struggle and, and uh, in the Tour de France in the past um, and then coming back and, and getting those stage wins and the green jersey, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's really nice to come back and do that. But it was something that I, I said a few years ago, like I had two years really bad luck in the Tour de France and I said, right, I need to come away from it, look at other Grand Tours, gain experience, get stronger, develop and come back as a better rider. And um, I did that. I grew up, I grew uh, like in my, like I, I got stronger, I, I got uh, more mature and uh, yeah, I was, I was ready for the Tour de France this year, and um, I was just um, I'm just so happy that I got this opportunity to ride it with with this team, with this support, um, and yeah, to, to, to actually finish off the job after after the team doing such an amazing job on the road the whole way. That's one of the very fascinating things about this all as well as the team, and I guess being a former teammate of Peter Sagan, who was your main competitor for this, what was that dynamic like? Uh, what was that competitive instinct that you had going uh, against Peter for the last couple of weeks? Yeah, it, 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 was a, it was a mad one because you you ride with these guys, for, I think I was with them six years, and um, you're used to you, you know battling on the road with them. And then all of a sudden you're riding against them, which was something quite new to me, I suppose. Um, but no, it was, it was really nice to be to be in the battle with Peter Sagan. Um, he won the jersey, I think, is seven times, um, and he's three times world champion. And to be able to bring the fight to him and to come out on top, um, I'm incredibly proud. But again, I wouldn't have done it without my team and the support that he gave me on the road. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, yeah, I, I suppose, uh, you don't really think about it too much, I suppose, when you're racing then, but, um, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's just happy I came out on top and I, I really enjoyed the battle. Uh, th that support that you get given that you mentioned there, like uh, we're obviously watching this via television alone. We obviously don't see the days that you're in the mountains. We get the notification that you have come home safely. Uh, could you paint that picture almost for us when you're high in the mountains and you know it's just about survival? Yeah, so like each stage there's a cutoff point and it goes off. When the, when the first rider crosses the line, they get the average speed and then there's a chart for whatever speed bracket they finished in, or the average speed. There's a they calculate um, like a um, uh, sorry uh, a time cut, and uh, it's just to make sure that people don't go way too easy, uh, and then they're too fresh for the next days. So you have to race to stay within the time cut every day. Um, so. Uh, so as a sprinter, that's really difficult because you're getting dropped on the climbs and then you're racing to get to the finish just to stay in the race. So even when you're not racing to win, you're racing to stay in. Um, and then it's just the whole team, they just stayed with me the whole time. 
we could have been we could have been getting dropped over 100 kilometers to go and they just they they they, they knew my capacities we have like um parameters on the on the bikes that read the, the power on the computer and they know my capacities so they they could say okay sam can ride at this for this amount of time so my whole team would stay with me ride at that pace and then they'd guide me through the whole stage and they'd calculate that i use the the least amount of energy to get inside that time cut but to get in safe um but i had the whole team support and they 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 they, they paced me on the mountains and then uh on the descents and on the flat they drove it on with me in the slipstream so it was really a battle in the mountains to keep me in the race and then they not only did they do that they were then on the flats riding to make it a, a bunch sprint and then to do lead outs and then to 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 bring me bottles and food and then yeah even just uh, the 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 soigneurs on the roadsides with the feed bags and preparing the uh, the mechanics and the, the director of sportifs in the cars with the information they give them the in the radios it was just a, it was just, it's just a, it's just a it had a big operation and a big support crew and a huge responsibility for you then to be the the point man on all of that. Yeah, um, the pressure comes with it. Um, but funny enough, it's something that I've kind of had now for for quite a while. And and I suppose in one sense, yeah, the pressure it builds when you don't finish the job off. Um, you always want to finish the job off when you get that support. Um, but the, the funny thing is, the biggest pressure that came. Um, for me this year, and there was something kind of new to me was I got I got some incredible support from Irish fans and people at home, um, but it was the pressure of expectation um, that was new to me. And uh, at one point that was almost crippling, and uh, you you nearly lose your legs. But after a few stages, I, I got used to it, and um, yeah, I was just I I, I really started to enjoy it and uh, I, uh, I really want to thank everybody for the support at home in Ireland. Was that after you got the green jersey that you kind of noticed that first? I think when I started, I think the first few stages I was pretty close and then uh, I think things started uh, gathering more momentum in Ireland um, and then I got the stage win and that I think yeah when the tears and everything came out I think that was the pressure as well coming out. That's really interesting because, like, uh, you know, cycling was one of those things that we all did over lockdown. The bike shops are kind of empty at the moment. They're just restocking again, finally. Like, you can just about buy a kid's bike again for the first time in six months. So uh, for you to come along at the end of this period where there are new cycle lanes all over the country and the greenways have started to become one of the few things that everybody's allowed to do because it's outdoors and you can socially distance. And then all of a sudden we have our first green jersey in three decades. Like, I can see why that might be a little bit of uh, added excitement and maybe a little bit of extra pressure too. Yeah, um, it just, it, it, it's all pressure, but um, I suppose this, it's, it's part of the job. Um, but I'm delighted to hear that uh, the bikes are sold out in Ireland and I'm delighted to, to see all these amazing bike paths for people to go out and be on their bikes because it's it really is a fantastic sport. and. Um, uh, I really encourage kids to get out on their bikes and to, to really just have fun. It it feels like getting the jersey was a, a confidence for you. Like it becomes kind of a, a shield in some ways. And then after that, you're like, okay, actually, I, you know, I, I can try and win this whole thing out. And, and that spurs on the stage win. And then after the stage win, you're kind of released into, I guess what I'm saying is it feels like we're going to see the, the coming out of you as somebody who really is 100% cresting to a peak that actually there's still more to come from you uh, I hope so <laughs> uh, took so many years to get here and um, I think so often like with sprinters um, because it's more of a uh, fast switch type uh, part uh, sorry I'm sorry I'm speaking broken English because I'm speaking to foreigners the whole time <laughs> uh, so I can't even speak my mother language, um, but uh, yeah, um, yeah. Like it, it took me so long to get here that I, I, I still hope that I have enough time to 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 
to to stay on top <laughs> and to, to get more wins but uh, but um yeah i think i kind of have a, a nice blend now of endurance and of speed and power and uh i think now there's there's a bit of confidence there um and i hope that the, the uh yeah the next few years maybe next two or three years that uh, i can get some some more good results i i, ho I hope <laughs> Are you going to the World Championships? Are you part of that true crew who are heading off to the World Championships pretty soon? So the World Championships this year has uh, an elevation of 5,000 metres of climbing. And uh, I don't have the frame for that, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, as a pure, uh, as a sprinter, it's just it's not possible for me to get over that and to get to the finish. I, 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 I'd be no good and I'd be just making up a number. Um, if I thought I could go there to help the likes of Eddie Dunbar, uh, Nicholas Roach, um, I, 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 Dan Martin, I, I, I would, but um, I, 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 I'd be completely useless. Um, and I know there's going to be people giving out that I'm not going there to represent Ireland, but I, I think I, I've done my best throughout my career and uh, the last months and years to represent Ireland the best way I can in, in my own in my own style so I hope they understand that it's just not a parkour uh, it's just not a, a course for, a course for me I don't think anybody's going to be giving out about you not representing Ireland well enough Sam I think uh, whatever you want to do is going to be fine with everybody so what is next then is there um, a, a, a much of the season left in terms of cycling that's going to be relevant to you and your talents um yeah I definitely have uh, three more uh, semi-classics, classics in Belgium um, next month. Um, but yeah, I could I could kind of hear the DS talking on the team bus, and I know they're kind of holding back a race program so that my head would stay in the Tour de France. Um, so I'm really afraid I'm going to get a phone call the next days and say, "Here's that. There's some races on the field." <laughs> and will you get home anytime soon? Do you think? I really don't know. Um, yeah, it's, it's just very hard to travel with COVID-19 now and, and the team want me to travel uh, as little as possible uh, and to stay safe. Um, um, we're, we're very lucky to get the to get a cycling season this year uh, and to get through the whole Tour de France with mm -hmm. COVID-19. So, yeah, I, I, I really don't know when I'll be home next. Well, listen, whenever you do get home, it's going to be a huge party. The whole country was totally behind you. You were right to feel that because it was one of those things that everybody was talking about. Wherever you went, people were tuning in. It was on uh, TG Car, it was on Eurosport. So everybody got to see it and to share in it. And it's been a long time since uh, we had something as a whole country to celebrate. So, Sam, you captured the moment brilliantly. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And th thank you. And uh, thank you for all the support from everybody at home in Ireland. That's uh, Sam Bennett there. Did you sleep in the green jersey last night, Sam? Uh, no, it, 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 it was stink. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, thanks a million. Take care. Hi, cheers. Thank it's, you. It's uh, a busy phone, as you would expect, from um, somebody whose life has changed, Owen, uh, Im immediately in the aftermath of that. He's going to be um, in great demand uh, in global cycling circles. And again, unbelievably humble. Yeah, that's one of the things that definitely strikes you immediately from listening to him is that uh, like almost that, that, that line about the, the pressure he felt from people getting in touch and seeing the reaction back home. That's just the mark of humility, the idea that you don't want to let your country down, despite the fact that, you know, the fact you've, you've got into the top 1% of people in your entire sport uh, is uh, an achievement in itself at times. And like it goes back, I'm not sure was it you or Adrian making the point on the show before, but like, I mean, even his last Tour de France finish, like the finish is the key part about it and the vast 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 majority of people in, the, in uh, the world even in cycling wouldn't get anywhere near that so to then go on top of that and actually win a jersey is uh, is remarkable and the uh, level of excitement and the tactics in that last stage look we've gone over time i hope you understand why it's not every day we get to celebrate something like that so here's what's coming up on the rest of the day on otb sports radio off the bench tennis player georgia drummy otb gold is uh, brian o'driscoll meeting Ethan asewe just a week after he'd kicked the winner in the Champions Cup final for Leinster. The History of Sport with Paul Rouse at 3 o'clock. Culture Hall of Fame is Dermot Kennedy from 4, talking about Gladiator. And OTB goal tonight is Michael Owen, who uh, Kenny Cunningham was around for the very first 
of his uh, Premier League goals. He told us a little bit earlier on. We're back on air with uh, Off the Ball on News Talk tonight from 7 o'clock and on the OTB Sports app. And we're back tomorrow morning from half past seven. Best of luck. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. Into sports.